The man. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, then steal in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. But before we join Superman, listen... And now to our story. When Bull Raglan, leader of a Northwoods fur smuggling gang, left Jimmy Olsen and Batiste bound hand and foot in a dark cave, his plan was to keep them hidden until he could bargain with Clark Kent, who he thought was a government agent. But unknown, even to Bull, the cave was occupied by a full-grown bear hibernating for the winter. Disturbed and angered, the bear attacked Jimmy and Batiste. Meanwhile, Kent, having captured Bull and his assistant Chuck forced them to go along with him while he followed Batiste's dog sled tracks out of the clearing where the French-Canadian guide had camped. As they neared the cave, Kent heard Jimmy's voice calling for help. Compelled to knock Bull out, Kent left him with Chuck, who had sworn he was going straight, and headed for the cave. As he neared the entrance, he could hear the wild growling of the bear. Help! Help! I'm coming, Jimmy! Good thing it's pitch dark in there. And this again, the bear's coming at me! Jimmy! Poor kid's fainted. Now I can handle this as Superman. All right, come on, Grizzly. Launch at me. Come on, that's it. Still up on your feet, eh? Oh, you don't like boxing, do you? Want a wrestle, eh? Get me in a bear hug. Okay, come on. There. Now let's see who can squeeze the hardest. Ah, I guess that finishes you. Now, let's see. Uh, Jimmy seems all right outside of a few scratches. Oh, but poor Batiste is badly mauled. Got to get them both back to town as soon as possible. Maybe a matter of life or death for Batiste. That means I'll have to leave Bull and Chuck behind and send someone back for them. It's taking a chance, but it can't be helped. All I hope is that Chuck doesn't see me leave the cave as Superman. Well, no time to waste. One under each arm. Out to the entrance. Up! Up! And away! Ooh, that burns. It can't be that bad, Jimmy. Oh, no. You try putting iodine on open scratches. Isn't that enough, Father Malone? I, I think it is, Jimmy. You're a very lucky boy. I'm lucky? You call this luck, I never want to have any more of it. Well, you were lucky that bear didn't swipe you across the face instead of the arm. And doubly lucky that Mr. Kent arrived when he did. Oh, by the way, how's Batiste? Well, we won't know for a day or so. He was badly torn up. But if the wounds don't infect, he'll pull through all right. Well, I must say, I hardly expected to see you back here so soon, but I am glad it turned out as well as it did. What happened to the two fur smugglers? The customs men picked them up. Chuck had kept his promise to see that Bull Ragland didn't escape, so they let him go. Father Malone's trying to get him a logging camp job. And what about Bull? I suppose he'd go to jail. Well, he should for what he did to Batiste and me. Gosh, Mr. Kent, I wouldn't be here now if you hadn't killed that bear. I still don't see how you did it. Oh, I told you I had a knife, Jimmy. Yeah? What puzzles me, Kent is how you managed to get both Jimmy and Batiste back to Montville without a sled. Well, it was a long hike, I admit. You mean to say you carried both of them ten miles? Well, Father Jimmy doesn't weigh any more than a puff of smoke, and Batiste is light. It's amazing, Kent. I don't think Paul Bunyan could have done much better. Oh, well, who's Paul Bunyan? Oh, don't you know, Jimmy? Oh, no, Father, I don't. Is he a friend of yours? <laughs> Jimmy, I'm surprised at you. Haven't you ever heard of Paul Bunyan? No. Why, he was the most famous logger ever to fell timber in the North Woods, Jimmy. And the strongest, too. Well, they claim he could cut down 400 trees with one swing of his axe. Oh, I don't believe it. No man could do that. Well, Paul Bunyan was no ordinary man. They say he owned a saw that was a half a mile long and that 200 men used to ride on it while he cut down a stand of timber. Are you trying to kid me, Father Malone? No, Father's not kidding, Jimmy. Any Northwoods logger can tell you stories about Paul Bunyan. Didn't he own a huge ox, Father? Oh, that he did, Kent. A big blue ox he called Bay. That's the one. It was the strongest ox in the world. And Paul used to feed it 3,000 tons of hay every morning and 5,000 tons of oats at night. Oh, where did he get all the hay and oats? I suppose Paul owned a 50,000-acre farm and grew it. 50,000 acres? Paul Bunyan's farm stretched from the northern tip of Minnesota to the southern tip of Michigan. And there was a road running through it that twisted and turned like a corkscrew. 
So one day, Paul hitched his big blue ox to the Michigan end of the road, and in ten minutes, Jimmy, that ox pulled the road out straight as a die, and it never had any more curves in it. Gosh. Talk about Batiste and his tall stories. Well, yours take the cake, Father Malone. Oh, these, these aren't my stories, Jimmy. They belong to the logging camps. They're a part of America, just like the stories of Hercules were a part of Greece. Oh, then they aren't true. Paul Bunyan never existed. As much as a legend ever exists, Jimmy. Oh, I see. When we get back to Metropolis, Jimmy, I'll buy you a book of Paul Bunyan's stories. Oh, that'll be swell. Say, when are we going back, Mr. Kent? Hmm? I suppose now that Batiste won't be up and around for a while, our dog sled trip to Canada is over almost before it began. I could get you another guide, Kent. Not as good as Batiste, but dependable. No, Father. I think Jimmy and I might just as well go on home. We both had enough excitement to last us a long time. We'll come up next year for our dog sled trip. Well, don't forget. As a matter of fact, if you let me know in advance, I might be able to arrange to go along with you. Oh, gosh, I hope you can, Father. Are you taking tonight's train, Kent? Yes, Father. That reminds me, Jimmy, you'd better get your clothes packed. We have less than an hour before the train leaves. Well, what time is it now? The clock is just about to strike seven. Okay, I'll be ready in ten minutes. Jimmy, hardly seems possible that last night we were up in the North Woods and tonight we're rolling across wheat fields. Jimmy. Huh? Oh, yes. Yes, what? Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't listening. Hmm. I was watching that man across the aisle. Look how his eyes shift, Mr. Kent. Almost like he thought he was being shadowed. Don't be silly, Jimmy. Here, take this newspaper. Read the funnies and do the crossword puzzle. Okay. Gosh, Mr. Kent... Oh, uh, now what? Look at this picture on the front page of the paper, and then look at that man across the aisle. Huh? Well, there seems to be a slight resemblance. Slight? What? The same person. The bald spot in front, and the gray hair in back, and the bushy eyebrows. Isn't everyone in the car to know you're talking about him? Wait a minute, let me see that paper. Well, why is this picture there, Mr. Ken? I didn't get a chance to read the caption. Just a minute, Jimmy. Wait, Scott. I believe you stumbled on something sensational. Who is he? Well, if it's the same man, and I think it is... His name is Dr. Roebling. He's the inventor of a new device having to do with communications. Listen to this, Jimmy. Dr. Roebling's device, although the nature of it has not yet been revealed, is said to be so valuable that the one model in existence is insured for $10 million. $10 million? Uh-huh. What do you think the device is, Mr. Kim? I haven't the faintest idea, Jimmy. But if that's Dr. Roebling sitting across from us, he's going to be interviewed by a Daily Planet reporter. Oh, I was right. I knew there was something strange about him. Well, we certainly hit the nail on the head that time. Well... Here goes for an attempted interview. I hope you get it, Mr. Kent. I'll just cross the aisle and drop into the seat next to him. Wish me luck. Okay. Good evening, Dr. Roebling. Eh? Oh, I beg your pardon. I said good evening, Dr. Roebling. Uh, you must be mistaken. My name is Harris. Oh, yes, yes, I, I understand. I'm Clark Kent, Doctor, reporter for the Daily Planet. I happened to be glancing over this paper and uh, noticed your picture. That young man is not my picture. I told you my name is Harris. It's, it's Walter Harris. Well, names don't mean anything, really. The important thing is your contribution to the field of communications. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, according to this story in the paper, you've just... How many times must I tell you that I have no connection with either the story or the photograph in that newspaper? Haven't you invented a new communications device? No, I haven't. Didn't you assure the model of the device for $10 million? Young man, if you have nothing better to do than annoy total strangers... May I suggest that you devote your unwelcome attention to others? Now, come, Doctor. That's not the proper attitude. Well, unless you cease annoying me, I, at once I shall be forced to call the conductor. All right. That's how you feel about it. That is exactly how I feel about it. Okay. Sorry I bothered you. I heard what he said, Mr. Kent. Do you think he's telling the truth? I'm not quite sure, Jimmy. He's the spitting image of this picture in the paper. Oh, well, maybe there'd be some initials on his luggage. No, he doesn't seem to have any luggage. Could be that we're wrong. Oh, gosh, I don't think so. The picture and the way his eyes keep shifting. And... Look, he's getting up. Mm, probably going into the dining car. Maybe we ought to follow him. No, I don't think so. He'll be back. Well, at least we can stop whispering. Gosh, that sure was exciting for a minute. Jimmy. Yeah? You see that crumpled up piece of paper he left on the seat? Uh-huh. Maybe something that'll tell us whether he is Dr. Roebling. Want me to get it? No, you sit tight. 
I'll walk up to the water cooler at the end of the car and pick it up on my way back. Okay. I'll keep my eye on it. I'll be right back. Gosh, I sure hope there's a clue on that piece of paper. A real exciting clue. What's Mr. Kent wasting time at the water cooler for? Why doesn't he hurry back? Here he comes. I can hardly wait. Okay. What's on the paper? Take it easy, Jimmy. Now wait till I read it. What does it say? Something very peculiar. What? It says... This is your last warning. What does it say, Mr. Kent? It says, this is your last warning. What can that possibly mean? Last warning about what? I don't know, Jimmy. Whoever wrote it certainly wasted no words. Hmm, this is your last warning. Might mean anything. There's absolutely no way to figure it out. Maybe we ought to turn it over to the conductor and have him notify the police at the next stop. You know, if our friend Roebling or Harris or whatever his name is wanted police protection, he would have asked for it a long time ago. Evidently, receiving this note didn't bother him much. Oh, I don't know about that. You remember I told you he looked like a man who was being shadowed? His eyes kept shifting and sort of sat hunched up in the seat like he wanted to make himself small. I think you're imagining most of that, Jimmy. Oh, no, I'm not. That's how I happened to notice him. Kept looking over his shoulder and watching everybody who came through the car. He's a suspicious character, all right. Believe me. Jimmy, you've been reading too many detective stories. What do you mean, suspicious character? Poor old man is probably just trying to dodge curiosity seekers. That is, if he's really Dr. Roebling. Oh, of course he is, Mr. Kent. Look at that picture in the paper. Look at it. Same bald spot on the front of his head. Same gray hair and back and the same thin nose. It can't be anybody else. All right, you make it sound very convincing, Jimmy. Let's go into the dining car, huh, Mr. Kent? Don't tell me you're hungry this early. Oh, I get it. You want to stick close to our mysterious friend. Well, it's partly that. <laughs> All right. But please remember to keep your voice down. You don't want everyone on the train to know that we're snooping into Dr. Roebling's business. Okay. I'll talk in whispers. Can we go now? I think so. Jimmy, you haven't touched your chicken. Oh, oh yeah. I'll eat it. You know that you've been staring at him constantly for the last five minutes? I'm sorry. If you're going to play detective, don't make it so obvious. I wasn't looking at him. I was watching the lady who sat down at his table. She's been talking to him. Well, you make that sound like a crime. What if she is talking to him? Is that against the law? No, but it might be a clue to something. Ah, oh, you know, I'm beginning to feel sorry we ever discovered that picture in the paper. From now on, your every waking moment is going to be concerned with clues and suspicious characters and heaven knows what else. Oh, you're just making fun of me. But you wait and see. Something's going to happen. <laughs> what was that? Oh, Dr. Roebling keeled over. You stay here, Jimmy. All right, miss. Don't get excited. I'll lift him back on the chair. There. Now let me have that glass of water. Oh, no. No, uh, don't give him any water, please. What? He's... No, he's my father. This, this happens quite often, really. He's... He suffers from vertigo, fainting spells. Oh, I'm sorry. If you could call the conductor, I'd appreciate it. He'd be much better off in the drawing room. He has some medicine there. Well, I'll be glad to help your father to the drawing room, Miss Roebling. There. You just lead the way. I'll carry him. Thank you so much. I beg your pardon, sir. Do you mind? Thank you. Just stretch him out on the lower berth. There you are. I don't know how to thank you for your kindness, Mr. Uh, Kent, Clark Kent. If there's anything else I can do before I leave... Oh, no, uh, no, thank you. I'll give Dad some of his medicine and he'll be all right. I'm sorry we caused a disturbance in the dining car. Oh, it was nothing. Well, good night, Mr. Roebling. Uh, Mr. Kent, before you go... Yes? I'm curious about something. How did you know my name? Well, that's easy to explain. I knew your father was Dr. Roebling. You'd met him before? No, no, but he was seated opposite me in the club car, and I happened to notice his picture in the afternoon paper. Oh, I see. But that explains it, of course. Well, good night again. Good night, Mr. Kent. Thank you. Hello. Well, still not finished with your meal, Jimmy? What's vertigo, Mr. Kent? Huh? Why, it's a... Uh... A form of dizziness that sometimes results in fainting spells. Where does it come from? I don't know, Jimmy. Well, I was right, wasn't I, Mr. Kent? He really is Dr. Roebling. And you were making fun of me. I apologize. That's all right. 
And that lady's his daughter, huh? That young lady, Jimmy. She's very charming. Gosh, Mr. Kent, you're not falling for her, are you? Finish your ice cream and stop asking silly questions. I don't suppose you mentioned that warning message to her, did you? Of course not. Are you going to? Well, I may if I see her in the morning. You all finished? Uh Uh-huh. What about your milk? Oh, I'm too full. Finish that milk. You begin losing weight on these jaunts around the country, we'll just have to cut them out. All right, I'll finish it. Waiter. Yes, sir? Check, please. Yes, I got it right here. Uh, 320. All right, here you are. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, I'm finished. Where are we going now? Back to the club car for an hour or so, and then to back to the club car for an hour or so, and then to bed. We can both use some sleep. Come on. Why don't you read, Jimmy? How about this hunting and fishing magazine? No, I don't want to read. I'm thinking. What are you thinking about? Oh, a lot of things. That newspaper story said Dr. Roebling had invented a communications device, didn't it? Yes. I wonder what a communications device could be. Well, there are just so many methods of communication. Telephone, radio, telegraph. That's about all except for the signaling methods, flags, and smoke pots. Well, do you think Dr. Roebling's device has something to do with sending messages? Possibly. There must be something. He won't even talk about it and tries to pass himself off as someone else. No, I don't blame him a bit. Undoubtedly, his invention has great military value. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the government has taken it over. A new secret method of communicating over long distances would be a boom to any nation at war. It would eliminate the necessity of having to use code. Train slowing down. Coming into a station, I guess. Yep. You didn't find out whether Dr. Roebling and his daughter were going to Metropolis, did you, Mr. Kent? No, Jimmy. No, my bump of curiosity isn't as large as yours. I don't, I don't ask people personal questions five minutes after meeting them. Mr. Kent. Yes? Could I see that warning message Dr. Roebling dropped? Hmm, if I can find it. Yes, here it is. Oh, thanks. This is your last warning. <laughs> That's funny. What's funny about it? Well, in the first place, it isn't signed. How could Dr. Roebling tell who sent it? Well, since it isn't signed, we can assume he knew who sent it. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about that message at dinner tonight before Dr. Roebling fainted. It may be very innocent, and we're just getting excited about nothing. No, sir. No, sir, this note is a threat. Oh, look at the way it's printed. Like a kindergarten kid prints. Now you're blossoming out as a handwriting expert, aren't you? Oh, gee, I can't say anything without being criticized. <laughs> I'm not criticizing you, Jimmy. I just think it's amusing. Well, you won't think it's so amusing if... If if what? Oh, never mind. Now, don't sulk, Jimmy. Where's your sense of humor? For all we know, this message may be very important. The fate of a nation might very well be hanging on it. Now, there you go, making fun of me again. Now, you're much too sensitive, Jimmy. Oh, well, maybe we'd better turn in. I'm going to stop by Dr. Roebling's drawing room and see whether he's all right. I may still get that interview. Can I come along? Yeah, I suppose so. In the next car. Follow me. Careful crossing this platform. Okay. Uh, Yeah, this is the room. Maybe they're sleeping. Oh, Miss Roebling couldn't be. It's only been a half hour since I left her. No answer. That's funny. Here comes the conductor, Mr. Kent. Good evening. Something I can do for you? Uh, why, yes, yes, there might be. I can't seem to get any response from the people in this drawing room. Oh? Friends of yours? Yes. I I don't think they're sleeping, and I'm concerned because one of them, an elderly gentleman, was ill early this evening. Can the door be opened from the outside? Yes. I carry the only key. We're not supposed to use it except in emergencies. Well, this is an emergency. Try knocking again. No use. What's your friend's name? Roebling. Dr. Roebling. Hmm. Let me check this passenger list. Drawing room C, car 421. What did you say the name was? Roebling. R-O-E-B-L-I-N-G. No party by that name in this drawing room, mister. You sure you got the right car? Well, of course this is the right car. I was in that room less than a half hour ago. Yeah, look here. Drawing room C, car 421. Mr. and Mrs. Jack Smith. Mr. and Mrs. Jack Smith? Honey, something's wrong somewhere. Right down on the card. Drawing room C, car 421. Mr. and Mrs. Jack Smith. But I tell you, I brought Dr. Roebling into this room less than a half hour ago. I'm sorry, but I've got to go by what's on the card. Mr. Kent, what is it, Jimmy? Maybe Dr. Roebling was traveling under the name of Smith. 
Didn't he use a fake name when you spoke to him in the club car? Yes, that's a possibility. Now, look, Conductor, this is a serious matter. I got no authority to open that door, mister. Well, who has the authority? The train master. Where is he? I'm up ahead of the train, checking tickets. Would you mind getting him for me? Eh, it'll take some time. He's seven cars up. But I'll tell him. Thank you. The old sourpuss. He said he had a key. Why couldn't he open the door? Well, it may be beyond his authority. We'll wait for the train master. In the meantime, would you do me a favor, Jimmy? Oh, sure. Go to our drawing room and get the pencil I left on the windowsill. Sure, Mr. Kent. I'm on my way. Be careful crossing the platforms. Okay. That conductor thinks I'm going to wait for the train master. He's crazy. Clark Kent might need a key, but Superman can force the lock without any trouble. Here goes. <coughs> Just a little more. Does it? Great Scott. The room's empty. How could they have gotten out with a door locked from the inside? Oh, I see. One of the windows is open. That doesn't make sense. Roebling was sick. Why should he and his daughter leave through a window? Something's wrong here. No baggage left behind. Nothing. I wonder what. I figured you were up to something like this. Oh, it's you. Yes, it's me. And you're going to be arrested for breaking into a room. Now, wait a minute. This room is empty. Something happened to the occupant. I don't care. All I know is that you're going to jail for illegal entry, and that's final. Very wise speaking. Yes? Good. Well, thank Judge Taylor for me and tell him I appreciate it. Well, what happened, Mr. White? Taylor released him in my custody. Oh, I know, but how did he happen to be arrested in the first place? You've got me, Lois. Fine thing. Daily Planet reporter pulled in like a common thief. I could throttle him with my bare hands. Where's Jimmy? Oh, he's with Kent. They left the courthouse ten minutes ago. They should be here. Hello, Chief. Hi, Lois. Hello, Miss Lane. Well, greetings. Don't you hello me, Kent. Close that door. Here around here is chilly. Colder than it was up north. Well, I'll make it hot for you. Now, what's the big idea? Do you think I'm paying reporters to get themselves arrested? Do you think Whoa, that... Oh, now, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. I've got one of the biggest stories of the year, Mr. White. I don't care if it's the biggest story of the century. I do care about this one. Dr. Roebling, inventor of that new secret communications device, was snatched off the train last night. Can't you're crazy. Am I, Jimmy? It's the truth, Mr. White. He was lifted out of the window of a locked drawing room when the train stopped at Martin City. That's why I was arrested, for breaking into the room to find him. But he was gone. And so was his daughter. Now, wait a minute. O'Brien, press room. Yes? Harry White, hold the front page of the seven-star final for replay. Okay. All right, Kent. Now, don't bother telling me about it. Get to a typewriter and give me at least a column. Fast. Okay, Chief. You'll have it in 20 minutes. forget about my being arrested. You know, in all the excitement, I never did hear what happened after you broke into the drawing room. Oh, the conductor caught me with the goods, as it were. Called the train master, and Jimmy and I were taken off at the next stop and turned over to the police. I tried to talk my way out of it, but nobody would listen. Somehow, that whole thing doesn't ring true, Clark. Very puzzling. You know, I checked on Roebling before we left Metropolis. To all appearances, he's been a hermit most of his life. Incidentally, what do you expect to find in Martin City? Oh, search me. It was Mr. White's idea, not mine. Well, you'd better start thinking. There it is, up ahead. A city of 500,000 people, and we're looking for one old man and a girl. All we can do is try. Mr. Kent, I can think of a lot more exciting things to do than sit in a hotel lobby all evening. For instance? Well, even a bad movie would be good compared to this. Mm, that suits me. Can't do anything till morning at any rate. How about a movie? Well, I take back what I said about a bad one. There isn't a good one in town. I, I think I'd rather go to bed. Okay. I'll find out at the desk. Why are you standing there like a wooden Indian? Feet nailed to the floor. Oh, see that blonde girl coming out of the elevator? The one with the green hat? Yeah. She's Roebling's daughter. Are you sure? Positive. Wait here. I'll be right back. Uh, good evening, Miss Roebling. Oh. Uh, don't you remember me? I'm afraid you've made a mistake. No, I haven't. 
I met you on the train last night. Your father suffered a fainting spell, and I carried him into his drawing room. Oh, of course. I'm terribly sorry. That's quite all right. You see, I, I'm really not myself. Father is dangerously ill. He's at the hospital here in Martin City. That's why we got off the train rather suddenly. Oh, that's too bad. Do you live here, Mr... Uh, I believe I've forgotten your name. Clark Kent. Oh, yes, of course. Now I remember. Do you live in Martin City, Mr. Kent? Uh, no, no, I just stopped off on business. I was sitting in the lobby with a friend of mine, a young lady, when I saw you step out of the elevator. Strange that we should bump into one another again. Yes, it's very strange. I'd like you to meet my friend. I'd be delighted to. She's over this way. Lois, this is Miss Roebling, Miss Lane. Oh, how do you do, Miss Roebling? How do you do? Did you say Lane? Yes, Lois Lane. The oh, name sounds familiar. You've probably seen no, it. No, it's quite common, Lois Lane. Or maybe you're thinking of the movie actress, Lola Lane. <laughs> probably. Well, I'm sorry to have to rush off, but I'd like to get to the hospital. You'll excuse me. Oh, certainly. Happy to have met you, Miss Lane. Good night. Good night. Good night. I hope your father's better. Thank you. Well, why did you break in on me like that? You were about to tell her she probably saw your name in the Daily Planet, weren't you? Well, yes, what of it? You don't think you're the only one who gets his name over his story? No, 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 don't go off the handle. I didn't want her to know we were reporters. Why not? Because there's something very rotten in Denmark. She told me her father's in the hospital here in Marden City. That's why they got off the train last night. Through the window? Yeah, she didn't stop to explain how, and I have a faint suspicion she's lying. There you go, building up fantastic stories. She seems like a thoroughly charming person. Well, you can't tell a book by its cover. I'm afraid we're not going to a movie tonight. Why not? We've got some checking to do. You call the hospitals and find out which one Roebling's at, if any. I'll check on the girl with the room clerk. Meet you back here. All right. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Have you a Miss Roebling registered? Roebling? Yes. Well, just a moment, sir. I'll see. No, I'm sorry. We haven't. Well, uh, she may have registered under another name. Well, what is the name? I really don't know, but I, I think she checked in sometime after nine last night. It's very important that I locate her, and anything you can do to help me will be appreciated. You say she may have checked in last night after nine. That's right. Well, let's see. There were only two registrations after nine last night. One was a Mr. Miller, and the other was a Mr. and Mrs. Jack Smith. What? Did you say Jack Smith? Yes. Mr. and Mrs. Jack Smith. That's it. What room are they in? 514. Thank you very much. I thought something was wrong. Where's Lois? Oh, there she is, coming out of the phone booth. Lois! Called all three hospitals. No Roebling. Of course not. Remember my telling you the conductor on the train said a Mr. and Mrs. Jack Smith were occupying that drawing room? Yeah. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Jack Smith are at this hotel in room 514. Well, well what do we do? Uh, well, uh, nothing tonight. You go on to bed. I'm going out for a walk. Okay. Night. Good night, Lois. Oh, I didn't think I'd get rid of Lois that easily. Now to investigate room 514 from the outside. No, thank you. 514 must be in the rear because my room is 714 and it faces the back. I guess I can duck through this alley. Now, here we are. Now the problem is to figure out which room is 514. Let's see, they start numbering from the left. The odd rooms face front and the even rooms face rear. That means 514 is the seventh room from the left on the fifth floor. Well, you take a chance. As Superman. Up! Up! Now, if my figuring is correct, this is the window. The room's dark. So I'd better step inside and look around. Up with the window. Both beds are empty. Nobody's here. I'll look around anyway. I might find something of interest. Well, no sense making it harder for myself by working in the dark. I'll turn on the light. That's much better. Now, let's see. Mm, just one large suitcase. I don't like rummaging through other people's belongings, but I think it's justified in this case. <laughs> That's funny. The initials on the suitcase are K.R. Could that R stand for Roebling? Let's see what's in it. Mm, a couple of dresses... Silk stockings, a pair of high heel shoes, nothing very exciting. Oh, wait. Driver's license. Issued to Catherine Roebling. Is it possible that she is his daughter? Can't figure this out. None of it makes sense. Wait, here's something else. A penciled memorandum on the back of an envelope. 218 State Street. Uh oh, someone's coming in. That means I go. Off with the light. 
No time to close the window. Out. And away. Forced to make a sudden departure because of a key turning in the lock of room 514, Superman is unaware that the person manipulating the key is none other than Lois Lane. Lois, attempting to steal a march on Kent and get the story of Dr. Roebling's disappearance first, has gone to the hotel desk, brazenly requested the key to 514, and is at this very moment slowly opening the unlocked door. Phew. Hmm. I had a few uneasy moments. If I'd have found anyone in here, heaven only knows what I'd have done. Now i got to work fast. Let me see. The light switch should be along this wall. Yeah, here it is. Hmm. Nothing but a suitcase. Well, Miss Roebling or whoever she is doesn't travel in any great style. Hmm, not bad-looking dresses. Let's see where they were bought. Madame Lenore. Well, our blonde friend must have money. Shoes, stockings, powder, package of hairpins. Not much of a story here. Oh, don't move, Miss Lane. And keep your mouth shut. I'm sorry. I, I walked in here by mistake. I see. And you decided while you were here to look through my suitcase. What do you take me for, a fool? Well, you don't have to point that gun at me. I'm not a criminal. Pretty close to one, I should say. Uh-uh, stay where you are. This little pearl handle revolver isn't a toy. It hasn't much of a bark, but it's got a terrific bite. Now, what are you doing in here? I might ask you the same question. Don't get smart. I don't like smart women. Well, then you won't mind if I leave. Take one more step and they'll carry you out of here feet first. Now... How did you get the key to this room? I simply walked up to the room clerk and asked for it. Why? Give it to me. I'm afraid you'll have to come and get it. I prefer having the door unlocked. Oh. So that's how it is. Yep. That's how it is. Now look, Miss Lane, I don't want any trouble with you. You broke into my room and I could have you locked up. Why don't you? Go ahead. Call the police. I don't need to. I can handle this in my own way. Now give me that key. Uh Uh-uh. Sorry. I said, give me that key. Still sorry. All right. You ask. And then, now wait. I believe you would use that gun. Sister, you came pretty close to getting it that time. Now hand over that key. Thanks. Now we can lock the door and have a little privacy. You think of everything, don't you? It pays to be careful, Miss Lane. My husband and I have too much at stake to take chances. Oh, you have a husband? Oh, yes. And you may have the pleasure of meeting him. That's my husband now. Stand back against the wall, Miss Lane. And don't move. Hello? What happened to you? Oh, I ran into a little trouble. What do you mean? I was just about to leave when I bumped into that man I met in the train. You know, Clark Kent? At the hotel? Yes, in the lobby. He had a girl with him, Lois Lane. She's here in the room now. Why are you wasting time? I told you I needed those papers immediately. Oh, take it easy, Jack. She broke into my room and I caught her going through the suitcase. What? Yeah. What'll I do with her? Well, who is she? I know, but the name sounds familiar. Well, lock her in the room and get down here as fast as you can. I think he's ready to sign. On the level? Yes. I must have those papers. I'll be there in ten minutes. Okay. You're a lucky girl, Miss Lane. Things are breaking right for us, so we're going to give you a break. I'll have to lock you in, but the maid will let you out in the morning. Thanks a lot. Oh, don't mention it. You'll pardon me while I toss a few things in my bag. And here I... You these manicure assistants to cut this telephone wire just so you won't be tempted to call anyone. That's very considerate of you. Don't mention it. There we are. All set. Well, goodbye, Miss Lane. Better luck next time. So long. Help! Someone let me out of here. Help! 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 Locked in the room with the telephone line cut, Lois pounds on the door until her hands ache, but all to no avail. Meanwhile, Superman, having once again assumed the disguising role of Clark Kent, has been seated in the lobby behind a pillar, awaiting the return of the mysterious young woman he now believes is Catherine Roebling. Suddenly, she steps out of the elevator, carrying her suitcase, approaches the desk, and checks out. Keeping well hidden, Kent follows her to the street, watches her slide behind the wheel of a blue roadster, and drive off. Rather than risk detection by trailing the girl as Superman, Kent steps into a waiting taxi cab and follows her. Bus is sure stepping on it, mister. Keep up with her. Yeah, but what if I get a ticket? I'll take care of it. Okay. Hold on now. We're going to make this corner on two wheels. You all right, mister? Don't you worry about me. Just keep that roadster in sight. Yeah, she's doing 70. I can't bump this crate up much higher. But if we can follow her tail lights a long way. 
Ah, baby, looking to take that right turn, huh? She almost went over. And yeah, that's a light car she's got. Don't hold the road so good. Well, here we go. <laughs> ah, you don't have to worry, mister. This jalopy is built solid. I'm not worried. And there's only one thing I don't like. Crossing these intersections at 65. It ain't healthy. Look out! A car coming out of the side street! Look out! Unhurt, despite the fact that the rear end of the cab folded like an accordion, Kent, making use of the strength of Superman, plows through the twisted steel to extricate the driver of the cab and the two occupants of the second car, all badly injured. Meanwhile, the girl in the blue roadster has reached her destination, far from the scene of the accident. Slipping into the dark hallway of a dingy tenement, she mounts the steps and enters a barren one-room flat, where Dr. Roebling, gaunt and looking older even than his years, is seated in a chair. Facing him is a youngish man with thin, cruel lips and shifty eyes. I thought I told you to get down here fast. I came as fast as I could, Jack. Close the door. Lock it. Where are the papers? I've got them in my handbag. Here. All right. All right, Uncle Walter. Now, all you have to do is put your signature on these two papers. I told you I won't do it. Why do you keep insisting? I thought you said he was all set. Shut up. Who is that woman? That's Catherine, my wife, Uncle Walter. Now, here's the fountain pen. Just sign there. I've seen her before someplace. Ah, yes, I remember. It was on the train. She sat at my table in the dining car. She was the one that... Put the drops in my coffee. Nobody put any drops in your coffee, Uncle Walter. You're just not well. And I want to see that your wonderful invention is protected. Come. Sign the papers. No, never. Never. You can keep me here until I drop dead, but I'll never give up the rights to my voice machine. I know what you want it for. To profit by it. You're my brother's son, all right. He was the same way. Grasping and avaricious. Are you wasting time, Jack? He won't sign that way. I'm handling this. Okay. Now look, Uncle Walter. I'm going to give you one more chance to sign these papers. Do you hear me? One more chance. Then we'll try something else. I don't care what you do. I'll never sign. Maybe you don't know it, but the world's on fire today. Civilization is fighting for survival. My voice machine can be used in that fight. No one can have it for private profit. All right, you old fool. You'll sign the rights over to me whether you like it or not. Get the hypo out of my bag, Tricky. Here. What does it do, Jack? Thank you. It'll make him groggy. He won't know what he's doing. But we've got to be careful. It's dangerous stuff. Come on. Hold his arm. You let go of me. Don't let go of me, I say. Roll his sleeve up. Jack, you're mad. You're insane. You're my brother's son. And Shut up. Now, hold his arm steady. That's right. Well, that's the last trip. If it isn't long enough to reach the ground now, there's nothing I can do. There. As tight as I can get it. Now to try it. Oh, I never knew the fifth store of a building was so high. Looks like a long way down. An awfully long way. Well... Only one thing to do. Find out whether this bed sheet rope will reach. Here goes. Out the window with it. It's hard to see in the dark. I can't tell whether... Yeah, I see it. It reaches. Oh, that's a relief. Ah, tied this end of it to the bed. Pull the bed over close to the window. Ah. There. That does it. Now, Lois, old girl, let's see how good a monkey you are. One leg over the sill. Just take it easy. It's a long drop if you make one slip. Now, now the other leg. So far, so good. Seems to be holding. Now, a deep breath and down slowly. Hand over hand. With amazing courage, Lois begins her perilous escape from the locked room climbing down the improvised rope to the ground five stories below. But unknown to her, the swaying of her body is rubbing part of the knotted bedsheet against the sharp stone corner of the window ledge, gradually cutting into the material. At any moment, it may rip and send Lois hurtling to her death on the stone courtyard below. Meanwhile, Clark Kent, unable to find Lois, has returned to the desk, where he makes further inquiry of the night clerk. 
Are you sure you haven't seen Miss Lane? Try and remember. She's dark, about five feet four, and very pretty. She was wearing a gray pinstripe suit and a brown hat with a, a greenish feather. I wonder. You wonder what? I wonder whether she could have been the young lady who asked for the key to 514. 514? No, no, that, that girl's blonde. Oh, there were two of them, sir. Two of them? What do you mean? Well, two young ladies asked for the key to 514. What? And as I recall, the first one answers the description quite accurately, except for the hat. She wasn't wearing a hat. Wait, let me get this straight. Two girls asked for the key to room 514? The first was a brunette answering the description I gave you? Yes, sir. Well, did you give her the key? Well, yes, sir. What about the second girl? Was she blonde? I think she was, sir. I told her the first young lady had taken the key. Yes? She seemed puzzled, but she said nothing. Just entered the elevator. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Going up, sir. Fifth floor, please. Fifth floor. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Good night. Good night. Here's 514. Hmm. There's sound coming from the room. Couldn't be two women in there, neither of them talking. That's impossible. Open up! Nothing doing. All right, we'll open it from the outside. As Superman, this lock shouldn't be too hard to force. But even as Superman slowly forces the locked door, grim tragedy is in the making in the room beyond. Worn through by constant rubbing against the stone window ledge, the knotted strips of bedsheet down which Lois is climbing are about to part, with the courageous girl reporter suspended four stories above a stone courtyard. Suddenly the material gives way. Lois screams as she hurts it down. What was that? Someone screamed. No one here. What's that hanging out of the window? Great Scott. Lois falling. Down, down. <clears throat> Got her. Only a few inches from the pavement. That was too close for comfort. I better land and see if she's all right. <sighs> Poor kid, she's limp as a rag, fainted dead away. I can't blame her much. That's a long drop. I think the best thing to do is take her to her room, as Clark Kent. No, no, that's no good. There'd be questions asked if I carried her through the lobby. I'll take her to my room, through the window. Up! Up! <clears throat> now, up for the window. And inside. There we are. Now, a little cold water should bring her to. Now, if I can just get some of this past her lips. That's a good girl. Swallow it. That does the trick. I'd better assume Clark Kent's role before she opens her eyes. You're all right, Lois. Take a little more water now. That's it. Oh, I'm falling. I think. Now, just take it easy. Clark. Clark, what happened? How did You're I... the luckiest girl alive, Miss Lane. What, what happened? How did I get hit? Last thing I remember, something gave way and, and I was falling. Oh, it's horrible. Well, you won't believe this, Lois, but you fell on a pile of mattresses. What? On the level. I imagine the hotel was getting rid of some old mattresses and they were piled up in the courtyard right under your window. If they hadn't been there, you wouldn't be talking to me now. That's funny. I didn't see any mattresses when I looked out the window before climbing down. What on earth made you attempt anything so dangerous? <laughs> the only way I could get out of the room. Why? Yeah, I got the key to the yeah. As Lois recounts to Kent the reason for her attempted escape from the locked room, Dr. Roebling, inventor of the voice machine, is at the mercy of his unscrupulous nephew and his blonde wife. At the moment, the two conspirators are standing at one end of the bare room, watching Dr. Roebling attempt to rise from the chair in which he is seated. What does that stuff do, Jack? The stuff you shot into his arm? It's supposed to make him dopey. Put him in a sort of trance. Let me go, Jack. He's my brother's son. The only flesh and blood. He can't get out of the chair. Uh, the stuff's beginning to work. What happens when he goes into the trance? Well, he'll do what I tell him. Sign that paper. Jack, listen to me. Listen. 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 Okay. I think he's ready. Come on. Oh, get the pen. Okay. Uncle Walter. Yeah. How do you feel, Uncle Walter? I feel... I feel all right. That's good. You remember you were going to sign a paper for me, Uncle Walter? A paper? For what paper? Don't you remember? Someone was trying to steal your voice machine, and you were going to sign a paper to keep him from stealing it. Oh, you must remember. Yes, yes, yes. 
Remember. Put the pen into his hand. Right. Now you're all ready to sign, Uncle Walter. Oh, you dropped the pen. Put it back in his hand. There, we picked it up for you. Now all you have to do is sign right here. What am I, Stanny? I told you, Uncle Walter. It's to protect you from having your voice machine stolen. You want to be protected, don't you? Yes. Protected. That's why you're signing. Now, come. Just write Walter Roebling on this line. Hurry, Uncle Walter. There isn't much time. That's it. He signed it. Shut up. Oh, no, Uncle Walter. Don't stop. You must write your last name, too. You just signed Walter. Hold his arm up. we got to work fast. That stuff will wear off. Come now. Finish it. There we are. R O E C L I N G. That's fine. All right, come on, Jackie. Let's get out of here before he comes around. Jack, you're marvelous. We've got it. It's on. Stow the chatter. I'll take the suitcase. Come on. Jack. Jack, you're my brother's son. My brother's son. Why are you doing this? Jack? My brother's son. I'd like to check the 218 State Street address pencil in the back of that envelope. I still don't understand why you insisted on getting our car out of the garage instead of using a taxi. I feel safer with a wheel in my own hands after that accident. Well, I trust myself with most cabbies. They're good drivers. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, at least they don't go through red lights. Oh, sorry. Didn't see it. <laughs> this car stops on a dime. Good brakes. Oh, there's the job I'd like to own. Huh? That blue roadster waiting for the light across the street. Blue roadster? Lois. What's the matter? That's the blue roadster Catherine Roebling drove off in. Look, she's in it now, sitting next to the man at the wheel. There they go. And we're going after them. Hold on. Are you sure that's the girl? Positive. I'm going to catch them if it's the last thing I do. Are you sure that's the car? After all, there must be hundreds of blue roadsters on the road. I'm positive, Lois. I told you I saw the blonde Catherine Roebling sitting next to the driver. Probably her husband. His name's Jack. That's what you called him over the phone. There's only one thing that worries me. What? They're doing 80 now. I can't get any more out of this car. The accelerator's down as far as it'll go. Sharp curve ahead. Yeah, I see it. Hold on. Oh, boy. I hope they don't come any sharper than that. Say, we've lost them, haven't we? Huh? Can't see their tail light. There must be another curve up ahead. Yes, there is. Not a bad one, though. Oh, I see them now. This is the road to Metropolis, isn't it? Uh-huh. That must be where they're headed. But but what happened to Dr. Roebling? There was just a man and a woman in the roadster. Well, either they left him behind or... Or what? Or he's in the rumble seat. You mean dead? Yes. Oh, they, oh, they couldn't do anything like that. What? Well, she's his daughter. I don't think she is, Lois. There may be some relation, but I'm sure it's not that close. Clark, they seem to be pulling away from us. I know, but there's nothing I can do about it. Trying to force this pedal down further. We're doing 82. Okay, sit tight. I'll give her all she can take. I tell you, we're being followed, Jack. Stop worrying, Chicky. But I don't like it. Suppose it's a cop. So we get a ticket. But he might ask questions. Oh, oh. Now, look, don't worry. I know all the answers. $50 $50 fines for speeding don't bother me anymore. Why, baby, you know what that paper you've got in your handbag is worth? Plenty. I'll believe it when I see it. Why, what are you talking about? It's in the bag. That machine is insured for $10 million. I heard he was offered twice that for it. $20 million? Yes. Well, why didn't he take it? Uh, because he's a crackpot, that's why. He's giving it to the government for nothing. Not now he isn't. It belongs to us. Ah, right you are, baby. Car's still behind us, Jack. Oh, forget it. Think about what you're going to buy first. The mink coat or a couple of dozen fancy dresses. What's it going to be, Chicky? Oh, I don't know. There's time for that. So what about this boy's machine, Jack? We got the papers, but how are we going to get the machine? I took care of that. I got the key to his place in Metropolis. You don't miss a trick, do you? Not many. What does this boy's machine do, Jack, that makes it so valuable? Well, I never could find out exactly... I guess maybe it's 
like a radio, only something special. Ah, oh, what's the difference? If anybody wants to pay $20 million for it, there must be something to it. <laughs> we'll find out soon enough. We should hit Metropolis by morning. Yeah, Chicky, in 24 hours, we'll be millionaires. With its powerful motor wide open, the roadster flies over the white ribbon of highway, its brilliant headlights cleaving the darkness. Meanwhile, a quarter of a mile behind, Clark Kent and Lois Lane seem to have run into trouble. What's wrong, Clark? I don't know. Motor's missing. Oh, great Scott. What is it? We're running out of gas. Well, wasn't the tank full? I guess not. Well, that's the end of it. Now what do we do? Well, I think I saw a house right around the bend. I can probably call a gas station from there and have them deliver five gallons. Well, you might as well say goodbye to the Blue Roadster. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Do you mind waiting here, Lois? I'll run up to the house and make the call. I don't mind if you hurry. Oh, I will. Not only won't I say goodbye to the Blue Roadster, but I'll be saying hello to it in just a few minutes. A nice big Superman hello. There, I'm around the bend now. Lois can't see me. This is one job I'm going to tackle in full Superman costume. Lucky I've got it on under this suit. There we are. I can leave Kent's clothes behind this bush and pick them up later. Up! Up! And away! Red cloak streaming in the wind, Superman is off like a bullet through the darkness, his surging flight carrying him forward faster almost than the eye can follow. Passing over the blue roadster, he drops down on the highway a mile ahead of it. Looks like we lost the car that was following us, Jack. Yeah, I figured we would. We're doing 90. This crate sure can travel. Hey, Jack, look. What's that up ahead in the middle of the road? Oh, I don't know. It's a man, isn't it? I think so, but well, what's he doing on the road? Stupid fool, why doesn't he move? I'll slow down, Jack. I'm not slowing for anything. You'll hit him. Jack, look out! Ah, good thing he got out of the way. We'd have smeared him all over the road. Gee, I thought sure you were going to hit him. Did you see what he was wearing? Yeah, it looked like a red cape. That's what I thought. Hey, what's happening? We're slowing down. No, it can't be. We're stopping. Well, that's crazy. The motor's racing. It won't be for long. Pardon me while I reach in and turn the ignition key. What? Huh? Hey, what's the big idea? Who are you? Get out of the car, both of you. No, wait a minute. I'm not in the habit of waiting. Get out. Come on, make it fast. All right, I'll help you out. No, no. You're breaking my arm. That's only a sample. Come on, Miss Roebling. I'm coming. That's better. Jack, it's the fellow with the cape. The one who was on the road. No, we're seeing things. It can't be. You're not seeing things. What's your name? Jack Roebling. Is she your wife? Yes. Do you know Dr. Walter Roebling? Yes, he, he's my uncle. I see. So that's the story. What story? I don't know any story. I'm afraid you know it all too well. No doubt you helped this clever young woman get your uncle off the train. Not quite certain what your game is, but I can imagine it isn't on the level. Jack, here's the gun. Put your hands up or I'll shoot. <laughs> Do you think that little pearl-handled toy frightens me? Get your hands up or I'll let you have it. Better toss that cap pistol in the bushes or I might lose my temper. Go ahead. Stand back. Toss it in the bushes. Stand back! Oh, no, you don't. Yeah, stay with us. We like your company. Let go of me. Let go of me. I think I'll have to quiet you down. That's better. Sorry I had to put your husband to sleep, Mrs. Roebling, but he's better off that way. Now, stop whimpering. Nothing's going to happen to you. Get in the car. We'll just dump this lovely specimen of manhood into the rumble seat. Provided it's empty. Let's see. Yes. All right, in you go. <laughs> now, Mrs. Roebling, before we drive back and I turn you and your husband over to an old friend of yours, Clark Kent, I have a few questions I'd like answered. I, I didn't do anything. Honestly, I didn't. I know exactly what you did. Where's Dr. Roebling? Back in Martin City. Where in Martin City? 218 State Street? Yes. How did you know? That's my business, finding things out. Why did you and your husband take Dr. Roebling off the train? What were you after? It was all Jack's idea. He knew about his uncle's voice machine. He wanted to get the rights to it. He made me help him. I see. All right. I'll deliver both of you to Mr. Kent, and Mr. Kent can deliver you to Dr. Roebling and the police. Now, 
now that we're all settled and on our way back to Metropolis, you have a number of things to explain, my friend. Okay, what's bothering you, Lois? In the first place, why are we going home by train instead of using the car? Well, it would have taken too much time to get it from where we left it on the road. One of the garage men is driving it back. All right. Now, where did you find Jack Roebling and his wife? Just around the bend in the road. They had a flat. He pulled a gun on me and I had to knock him out. And yet, all the way back to Marden City, the blonde babbled about being attacked by a giant in a red cape. Oh, she was hysterical, Lois. What's more important is that we got those assignment papers for Dr. Roebling and probably the biggest feature story of the year. What do you mean? Well, you know, I just walked back to Dr. Roebling's drawing room to see whether he was all right. He's yeah. resting comfortably. You know what he told me? What? That only two people in the world, government officials, had ever been given a demonstration of his voice machine. Clark Kent, are you out of your mind? Huh. Is that what you call the biggest feature story of the year? Patience, Miss Lane, patience. At five o'clock tomorrow afternoon, Dr. Roebling is going to demonstrate the machine to you, Mr. White, and myself. And because of what we did for him, the Daily Planet will be the first newspaper in the world to reveal his secret. What is the secret? We'll find out at five o'clock tomorrow afternoon. I want once again to express my appreciation to you, Miss Lane, and to you, Mr. Kent, for your invaluable assistance to me. Mr. White, you may well be proud of your employees. Don't pile it on too thick, Dr. Roebling. They'll be asking for substantial increases. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they do, they deserve it. And now to the business at hand. Uh, you know what happens when you throw a stone into a pool of water? It, it makes a circle of little waves that keep traveling further and further out until they just disappear. That's correct, Miss Lane. Now, the same principle applies to the spoken word. The moment my voice leaves my lips, it sets up a series of vibrations or sound waves that strike your eardrums and are immediately translated into the words that I've spoken. Does radio communication work the same way, Dr. Roebling? But in a similar manner, Mr. White. Uh, but now we'll go one step further. It's always been believed that unless sound waves are captured immediately, they're forever lost. Uh, let me explain. Assume that none of you were in this room at the moment. Uh, I'm alone. And I say, one, two, three, four, five. However, since none of you is within what we call listening distance or earshot, you cannot hear me. Now, five minutes later, you enter the room. Do you think you would hear what I had said five minutes before? Of course not. That's impossible. Well, they said radio was impossible, Lois. Yes, and travel by air. Nothing is impossible, Miss Lane. I have definitely proven that sound waves never vanish. Unfortunately, your ear is not a sensitive enough mechanism with which to pick them up once most of their force has been used. And that is where my voice machine comes in. You mean your machine can pick up voices no matter when they were created? Yes, Mr. White. Now, I'll demonstrate. Uh, you recall a few minutes ago I said that you could be proud of your two employees, Miss Lane and Mr. Kent. Uh, what was your reply? Mm, now, let's see. Uh... He said not to pile it on too thick or we'd ask for salary increases. Uh, yes, that was it. Now, I'll turn the machine on and see whether we can pick up that sentence, Mr. White. Now, I turn this directional dial to the approximate location of this room. And I adjust this gauge to the exact time when the sentence was spoken, uh, which I noted on the stopwatch while we were talking, by the way. I uh, throw this switch and now see what happens. Don't pile it on too thick, Dr. Roebling. They'll be asking what for will substantial be? increases. <laughs> well, there you are. It's amazing. What? I can't believe my ears. Well, now, let's try it with something that you said, Miss Lane. I particularly noted your answer to one of my questions. Uh, what happens when you throw a stone into a pool of water? Why, well, yes, I said... Now, now, don't tell me what you said. Let the voice machine do that. Now, all we have to do is to set the time gauge and throw the switch. It makes a circle of little waves that keep traveling further and further out until they just disappear. Dr. Roebling, this is incredible. But now you can see why I vowed that never will this device be placed in private hands. Why would your voice machine... Well, war would be eliminated. It would be ridiculous for one nation to plot against another because the very plot could be exposed for all the world to hear. And a, a world such as... Well, Abraham Lincoln dreamed of would actually become a reality. Well, your enthusiasm is very gratifying, Mr. Kent. Uh, you spoke of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, would you like to hear his Gettysburg address? Oh. Is that possible? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we have the exact time and place. It was 10 o'clock in the morning on November 10th, 1863, at the National Cemetery at Gettysburg. Now, a moment, I'll adjust the dials and gauges. Kent, we're witnessing man's greatest creation. The most thrilling thing I've ever experienced. Now, uh... I think we're ready, gentlemen, and Miss Lane. Now, I'll throw the switch. Well, what's that? 
Why, I don't think... Oh, why, of course, of course. It's the sound of a crowd of people gathered there to hear the... Uh, listen, listen. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in is that great really Lincoln talking? Civil war. Uh, I'll turn the volume down. But it's his voice, Miss Lincoln. What that of course, Lincoln has been dead for more than 75 years, years, but so his voice lives on and it so will live on forever. Dr. Robing, I want to shake your hand and congratulate you. Well, thank you, Mr. White. I want to add my congratulations to Mr. White, Dr. Robling. And mine as well. What? It's a miracle, that's all it is. Well, you're all very kind, and I thank you again. Now I have just one favor to ask. Name it, and it's yours. Well, I told you that I would give the Daily Planet the first opportunity to tell the complete story of the voice machine. Yes. Well, I don't intend to go back on that promise. Good. However, I'm going to ask you to wait just a few days until this model, the only one in existence, can be delivered to the government. Why, of course we'll wait. And now, if you don't mind, Doctor, I'd like to hear the rest of Lincoln's address. Well, certainly, certainly. I'll turn the volume up. That we here highly resolve that the dead shall not have died in vain, that the nation shall, under God, have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Imagine standing here and and listening to Lincoln's voice delivering those immortal words. Well, I I can't find enough adjectives to describe it, Doctor. It's it's just stupendous. Uh, now I can see the service that Kenton Laws did for you in rounding up that crooked nephew of yours. Uh, what happened to them eventually? Uh, he and his wife. I assume you turned them over to the police. Well, no, Mister White, I didn't. Hmm? Uh, to my knowledge, it's the boy's first mistake. I couldn't bring myself to give him a police record. But I think he's learned a lesson. Mm, I hope so. Well, I've got to get back to the office. Uh, what about you, Kent? Lois? We'll go back with you, Mr. White. I'll call you in a day or two, Dr. Roebling, and thanks again. Well, that's quite all right. Now, here, I'll lead you up the steps. Okay? Well, Lois, Kent, you two have the opportunity of a lifetime to write the greatest story ever written about the greatest thing... Having witnessed the demonstration that left them spellbound, Kent, Lois, and Perry White leave Dr. Roebling's huge house in the suburbs and drive into town pledged to temporary secrecy concerning the amazing machine that snatched the voice of Lincoln, the great emancipator, out of the air and made it live and breathe again. But unknown to any of them, including the elderly inventor, shifty eyes are watching their departure from behind a hedge surrounding the property, the eyes of Jack Robley. Crouched beside him is his blonde wife, Chicky. As the taillights of Perry White's car vanish in the distance, Jack Robling stands erect. Okay. He's alone now. Come on. Oh, Jack, you're mad. Please don't do it. If they catch you this time, it's jail for a long stretch. Nobody's going to catch me. Oh, that's what you said before, and look what happened. He could have sent us up for five years, but he let us go. What more do you want? Now listen to me. I'm the only living relative he's got. He's old, and he'll kick off soon. But unless he's got dough, what good will it do me? Oh, I don't know, Jack. Why take any chances? I'm not taking any chances. The machine won't do me any good now couldn't sell it if I had it now that those newspaper mugs know what happened. But it's insured for ten million smackers. That means if I bust it up, the old man is rich. And I'm his only living relative. You're crazy if you think he'll leave it to you. He won't have to leave it. He's got no will and he'll never have one. That door will be mine every cent of it. Come on, we're wasting time. Oh, Jack, please don't do it. Come on, I said. I know this house like a book. My old man used to bring me here when I was a kid. Laboratories down in the basement. And there are three windows to it at the back of the house. This way. Jack, please. Shut up. I know what I'm doing. Now, wait a minute. Hold up. Keep down. There he is on the second floor. In this library. He'll hear you trying to get into the basement and call the police. No, he won't. The floors in that house are three feet thick. Come on. But keep low. You got the hacksaw? Yeah. You see? He's got iron bars on the window. Give it to me. Oh, for the last time. I told you to shut up. If you don't like it, scram. All right. I will. Come back here. 
You're in this up to your neck, so sit tight. But I don't want any part of it. Your uncle treated you better than you deserved. And now you're knifing him in the back. Since when are you getting so touchy? Your hands aren't so clean. I know it, and I don't want to get them any dirty. You'll get them as dirty as mine and like it. Can you hand over that saw? Here. Five bars. Ah, this won't take long. Go on, you keep an eye out and let me know if you see anyone. And don't cross me if you know what's good for you. Where's the can of oil? In your pocket. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got it. Now, let's see how this saw works. Yeah, perfect. In a half hour, this wind... Can't work this blade too fast. She heats up. How's it look, Chicky? Nobody's coming. Jack, why won't you listen to me? What'll this get you? Maybe ten years in jail, that's all. Who asked you? Oh, wait a minute, Jack. Let go my arm. Listen to me, Jack. Just give me a chance to say a few things, and, and then if you want to go ahead, okay. All right, talk fast. We haven't got all night. Remember when you first told me about your uncle and the machine he was inventing? Yeah, I remember. So what? Well, you told me he was no good. You said he was out of his head. Uh, a crackpot, that's what you called him. That's what he is. Well, anyway, you talked me into helping you take his invention away from him. Because the way you told it, it belonged to you by right. What are you driving at? Justice, Jack. We tried to get it from him, and we were caught. He could have sent us both up for five years. He didn't. He turned us loose because he didn't want you to have a police record. And no guy who does that, Jack, can be so bad. Ah, he's still a crackpot. Well, what if he is? He never hurt you, did he? Oh, can the chatter. I got work to do. Oh, one more thing, Jack. You're going to cut through those bars. You're going to climb into the basement and bust up your uncle's voice machine. All I want to know is, what'll it get you? Just what I want. Revenge and the ten million bucks the machine is insured for. You haven't got a chance at the ten million, Jack. And you know it. That means you're going to knife an old man who did you a good turn just for revenge. Well, I'm not. What's that? I said I'm not. I'm part of Wait a minute. Did I hear right? You heard perfectly. I've done some things I'm not very proud of, but this is one thing I won't do. Oh, uh, no? No. So long. Come back here. Sorry, I'm putting out. Chicky, I'm warning you. Come back. Okay, you little double-crosser. This will stop you. Where is she? I'm sure I hit her. Chicky. Chicky. That's funny. Chicky. I don't get this. Well, one thing I know. She can't take the car. I got the keys. Maybe I missed her. Okay, let her hike into town. That'll give me time to finish the job here. Guess the old man didn't hear those shots. I thought they were backfires. And no time to waste now. Which window is it? Oh, here. Okay. Four more bars to go. Oh, come in, Ken. Close the door. Here's the report you wanted on the demonstration of Dr. Roebling's voice machine. I don't think I left anything out. Good. I wanted that down on paper while it was fresh in your mind. Kent, that was the most amazing thing I've ever witnessed. Yeah. Imagine standing in that basement room on the outskirts of Metropolis and listening to Abraham Lincoln delivering the Gettysburg Address. Oh, it's like a dream. Yes, it certainly is. I can't wait to break the story, Kent. It's the scoop of the century. Oh, incidentally, uh, did you understand Dr. Roebling's explanation of how the machine works? Oh, yes, it's simple enough. You remember what Dr. Roebling said about dropping a stone into a pool of water? Yes, it makes waves. That's right, and so does sound, sound waves. Dr. Roebling's theory was that these sound waves never completely disappear. That if he could develop a receiver sensitive enough to pick them up, he could recreate the sound no matter when it occurred. And he's done it. And that's just the way I want you to write the story the moment Roebling gives us the go-ahead. Simple. You know, so everyone can understand it. Uh-huh. Very wide speaking. Who? Oh, hold on. To you, Kent. Oh, thank you. Hello? Uh, yes, this is Clark, Kent. What? A young woman. I see. Yes, yes, I... All right, I'll, I'll be there in five minutes. Thank you. What's the trouble? You look worried. Well, that was the city hospital. 
A woman was just brought in, an emergency case. And she keeps asking for me. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. I'd better get down there. No telling what it might be. No, I'll go with you. Okay. Meet me at the elevator. Dr. Talbot, report to emergency ward. Dr. Talbot, report to emergency ward. Uh, this Talbot, is the report room, gentlemen, but before we go in, I'd like to tell you what we know of the case. That's a very good idea, Doctor. Uh, according to the police, the motorist picked this girl up on Metropolis Boulevard. I see. She was semi-conscious with a bad bullet wound in her back. How she ever managed to stay on her feet is a mystery. She was brought here and will be operated on within the hour. She's conscious now and keeps repeating your name, Mr. Kent. Yes, we have no means of identifying her and thought possibly you might supply some clue. Oh, I'll do my best. Good. We shall go in. Kent. Clark Kent. Get Clark Kent. You see? I'll close Kent. the door. Get Clark Kent. I know the girl. Her name is Catherine Roebling. Who's there? Is it Clark Kent? Uh, you may go over to the bed. All right. I'm here, Miss Roebling. Oh, Kent. They found you. Yes, I came the moment they called. Come close. It's hard to talk and there isn't much time. All right. Jack, my husband, he, he, he's trying to... Uh, try to... <coughs> Just take it easy, Miss Roebling. <laughs> Who did this to you? Listen. This is important. Jack is trying to break into his uncle's laboratory. What did you say? Yes, he, he's sawing through the iron bars... On the basement window. What? He he wants to direct the voice machine. How do you know? Oh, I, I know, believe me, I know. You've got to hurry. There isn't much time. Hurry. Let's hurry. Let's stop him. Hurry. She just told me something that makes it necessary for me to leave at once, Doctor. I'll be back. Now, wait a minute, Kent. I'll go with you. You'd better not, Mr. White. This may be dangerous. I said I'll go with you. Okay, come on. say this is the same nephew who forced Dr. Roebling to sign over all rights to the voice machine? Yes, that girl in the hospital is his wife. Who shot her? She didn't say, but I think I can piece it together. Evidently, she refused to help her husband break into Dr. Roebling's laboratory to destroy the voice machine. You mean you think her husband shot her? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Oh, hold on, we make a turn here. Why, the dirty rat. Roebling should have tossed him into jail the first time. Yeah. Kent, I hope we're not too late. Do you know what it means if that machine's wrecked? I know. No, Roebling's an old man. He'll never live long enough to rebuild it. Well, maybe we're not too late. There's the house up ahead. I'd better park on the driveway. Come on, Mr. White. Where to? Well, she said he was sawing the bars on a basement window. Now, wait a minute. Hold up. There's the window. See it with the bars missing? Yes. Come on. Don't touch that machine, Roebling, if you value your life. Who's there? Never mind. Don't touch that machine. I've got a gun and I'm coming to the window shooting. Get around to the front of the house, Mr. White. Find Dr. Roebling and have him call the police. Hurry! Okay, be careful. I said I'm coming to the window shooting. Stand back. I think it's high time Superman took over. Roebling! Look out, mister. Evidently you don't recognize my voice, Roebling. I'm not kidding, mister. Neither am I. I'm going to give you one chance to toss that gun out of the window and follow it yourself. Just one chance. Ha! Ha! Here's what I think of you. All right, you've had your chance. Now I get mine. That gun won't help you. Nothing can help you now. You won't get me. Not until I smash this machine into a thousand pieces. What? I warned you about that. Now you'll suffer for it. Ah! Let me go. Let me go. I'll let you go into dreamland. Mr. King. Mr. King. I better switch back to Ken in a hurry. Ken, where are you? Down here, Mr. White. Turn on the light, Mr. Kent. Pull the cord over the table. What happened? There. You can see for yourself. Good grief. The machine. Your nephew smashed it. I was a split second too late. My voice machine. It's ruined. Completely ruined. It's ruined. Tears of sympathy form in the eyes of Clark Kent and Perry White as they watched the elderly gray-haired inventor stand before the twisted mass of steel and wires that was once a monument to his genius. 
Dazed and bewildered, he turns away from the wreckage, shoulders bowed and head hung low. Gently, Clark Kent touches his arm. There may be some way of repairing it, Dr. Roebling. No. No. No, Kent, I'm... I'm afraid it's a hopeless task. Why do you say that, Dr. Roebling? Well, well, when I built the machine, Kent, I, I worked for the set of diagrams, but... Well, I was afraid, once it was finished, that somehow the diagrams might fall into the hands of the wrong people. And, and so I, I destroyed them. I, I burned them in the fireplace. And now, as a result, everything I do must be done from memory. Oh, I'm sure that doesn't hinder you. My memory doesn't serve me as well as it used to, Kent. Now, uh, this wire, for instance. I can't recall in which terminal the other end belongs. Well, if one doesn't work, try the other. There are 9,000 connections in this machine. 9,000 chances to be wrong. No, either I'm right the first time or it's hopeless. But, Dr. Roebling, uh, you could... That electric drill, please. Oh. Here, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, to think that a split second of madness could destroy a lifetime of work. Just one split second of... Well, Doctor, does it work now? No, Kent. No. I've checked everything a dozen times. The trouble is I don't remember. If only I could remember, but it's no use. It's no use. But you can't give up now, Doctor. Another hour or two may bring success. Well, all right, Kent. I'll, I'll try just once more. Just once more. Nine o'clock. Still no luck, Doctor? No, Kent. I tell you, it's no use. Listen. Dr. Roebling. Is it all right? Wait. Wait, I'll set the direction dial to the National Cemetery at Gettysburg. Here. And, and the time dial to 10 a.m., November 10th, 1863. There. Now, if we pick up Lincoln's... Lincoln, Gettysburg address the way we did this afternoon. The machine's thick. Pray, Kent. Pray, I'm throwing the switch. There's the murmur of the crowd. Yes. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers... It works, Dr. Rowling. You fixed it. Listen to Lincoln's voice, clear as a bell. Uh, there must be a kindly providence watching over me, Kent. A very kindly providence. Uh, do you mind if I shut it off? My head's dropping. No, of course not. Now we... Kent, I don't know how to thank you for your help tonight. I was in your debt before, and now that debt can never be repaid. Oh, nonsense, Dr. Roebling. The mere fact that you're going to let my newspaper publish the first story about your voice machine is sufficient payment for everything. But, uh... I meant to ask you a question, Doctor. Yes? Something concerning the machine. Yes. Since I'm going to do the story, I'd like to know as much about it as possible. I know you're tired, but I'm sure you won't mind answering just one question. Oh, no, no, of course not. Well, you demonstrated how it was possible by setting the time and direction dials of the voice machine to pick up sound waves no matter when they were created. That is, as long as you knew the time and place, the rest was easy. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'd like to know is whether the machine, if set for, oh, well, say... Seven minutes after ten, the exact time it is now. And directed to, let's say, the city of Metropolis. Would automatically pick up any and all conversations taking place at this moment throughout the city? Well, that's a very sensible question, Mr. Kent. Uh, now, to begin with, the, the direction dial cannot be set for the entire city, since that covers too wide an area. Oh, I see. It, it can, however, be set for the exact center of the city. Oh. And you can take your chances on whatever sounds are being produced at that location at the moment. Oh. Uh, now, uh, here, just a minute. I'll show you. Oh, don't bother now, Doctor. Some other time. No, no, it won't take but a few seconds. Yeah. Now, let's see. It's exactly seven and a half minutes after ten. There. That takes care of the time dial. And now, the direction. Yeah, there. 
Now, something should happen when I throw the switch. Oh, sounds like traffic noises. Exactly what it is. We'll tune into a street corner. Wait, I'll change the direction. What's that? Well, I believe it's a train. Well, you're right. We're at the railroad station. Yeah, well, let's try again. Now, here, I'll turn the direction dial just five points. All right, boys, sit down. Here's something. Here's a meeting of some kind. You must be wondering what I got you down here for at this hour of the morning. Yeah, I hit the hay at six o'clock. A guy's got a sleep so he's sort of early. Yeah, Curly, this is serious business. You all know what happened to Benson. He got caught. And they're holding him for questioning. Say, this sounds interesting, Dr. Roebling. He's liable to talk, and if he does, it'll be plenty bad for all of us. What are you going to do? I'm coming to that. Keep your shirt on. If Benson talks, we're all in the suit, including the big guy, and he don't like the idea at all. Okay. So something's got to be done about it, fast. What are you driving at, Duke? Somebody's got to get Benson before he opens his trap and shut it for him. Permanent. Did you hear that, Dr. Roebling? Yes, but what does it mean? Wait a minute. One of you boys is elected. Any volunteer? I can almost see the yellow running off your spine. I like the tough job, Duke. Benson's in jail. How many would get those? That's up to the lucky guy. He'll have to find a way. All right, since I figured none of you brave boys was going to step up and take the job, I rigged up another way of doing it. You see this hat? It's got seven slips of paper in it. One for each of them. Six of them are blank, but the seventh is marked with a black cross. The guy who gets the black cross does the job. They're drawing lots to commit a murder. Well, hadn't we better notify the police? No, wait, this time. Listen. Okay, can the chatter. I'll pass the hat around. Everybody take a slip of paper, just one. Don't open it until I say so. Take one, Lefty. Good. White. Red. Curly. Jig. Come on, Trigger. Joe. And you get the last one, Spud. Dr. Roebling. And before you open them, get this straight. There's no backing out. Understand. The guy who gets the black cross does the job. Go ahead, open it. I got it. Take it easy, Curly. Now, the rest of you guys clear out. And not a word about this to anyone. Beat it. Hi, here's a Mr. King. Just wait a minute. Sit down, Curly. Hey, why did I have to get it down, I said? Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting. Now, get a hold of yourself, Curly. Stop shaking. Oh, I, I ain't shaking up much. Now, listen to me. If you play this smart, you're on top of the heap, see? The big guy don't forget things like this. He pays off, and good. Yeah, but how I work it? Vincent's in the city jail. How'll I get to him? It's a fit. Wait a What's that clicking noise, Ken? He's dialing a phone number. This is oh. amazing, Dr. Roebling. Simply amazing. Listen. Hello? What are you getting for fish today? Okay, Chief. Everything's all set. Yeah. I'll be there. So long. I gotta go now, Curly. Meet me at the club in two hours. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that's all we're going to hear. Yes, I'm afraid so. Might as well turn the machine off. Uh, what do you make of it, Kent? Well, it's all very simple. Benson, whoever he is, is a marked man, despite the fact that he's in jail. We know two names, Duke and Curly. The rest is shrouded in mystery. Well, you should be able to trace Benson easily enough. Yes, yeah, that won't be difficult. He can be protected for the time being. But why are they out to get him? And who was the big guy they referred to? Oh, well, I'll take that up with the police and the district attorney. Don't you worry about it, Dr. Roebling. Just keep the direction dial set where it is. We may hear more later. But it's strange, but I never realized the voice machine could be used to prevent crime. Doctor, that machine can rebuild civilization. Wait, what's that? That sounds like a police car stopping in your driveway. But shall we go upstairs? Oh, I think we'd better. Wait, someone's banging on the front door. I'll see who it is. Just a minute. Okay, buddy, get him up. Well, this is a surprise. Do the Metropolis police point their guns at everyone this early in the morning? I don't get why. Uh, what's the matter, Kent? Uh, why are these policemen pointing guns oh, at you? Are you Clark Kent? Yes. Well, you're under arrest. And to know what this is all about. If you're not dealing with any two penny sister, Warren, I'll splash this across the front page of the planet and have you run out of office. Now, take it easy, Mr. White. You're not young anymore. Excitement isn't healthy. Who's not young? Don't you look at my gray hair. I didn't get him from age. 
I got it from aggravation. Yes, aggravation. Every time one of you adult-painted public officials pulls a boner like this, I get more gray hair. Now, where's Clark Kent? I demand his immediate release. I told you, I've already sent for it. Then why in the name of heaven did you arrest him in the first place? What's he done? I'm not certain he's done anything, Mr. White. He was apprehended for questioning. Apprehended for questioning. With Metropolis overrun with gangsters, racketeers, petty chiselers, and gamblers, you've got nothing else to do but apprehend a newspaper man for questioning. I think you're going a little too far, Mr. White. I'll go as far as I like and further. You can't fight me. You can't... Hello, Chief. Well, fancy meeting you here. Uh, that'll be all, Mr. Close the door right outside. Yes, sir. Okay. What's the meaning of this? Why did you pack this fumbling... Now, just a moment, Mr. White. I'll ask the question. Sit down again. Thank you. Now, I'll make this as brief as possible, since I realize Mr. White is a busy man. You're darn tootin' I am. Kent, early last night you visited a woman at the city hospital. A woman we believe to be Catherine Roby. Yes, and I was with him. Her husband shot her in the back. Please, Mr. White... Let me handle it. Is that true, Kent? Yes, quite true. According to the hospital report, the woman had been calling your name and you were summoned to identify her. You did. You engaged her in conversation, then you left the hospital in a great hurry. Is that true? Uh, of course it is, and we can explain it. For the last time, Mr. White, I must ask you to stop interrupting. Oh, go pedal peanuts. The uh, information you have, Mr. Warren, is completely authentic. I did identify Mrs. Roebling... I did engage her in conversation, and I did leave the hospital in a great hurry. Why? I am not prepared to say. Kent, are you crazy? You know very well why we left the hospital. You know I that... I said I'm not prepared to state my reasons. Why? Then I'll state it for you. Just a minute. Now, don't just a minute me, Kent. We left the hospital because the girl told us her husband, Jack Roebling, was breaking into his uncle's house to destroy a machine worth ten million dollars. And he was the one who shot the girl. Her own husband. Is that so, Kent? I, uh, I'm not prepared to say. Are you out of your mind? What's come over you? The Homicide Division has questioned this man you mentioned, this Jack Roebling. He denies having shot his wife. As a matter of fact, Kent, he says you did it. Oh, what? Please lower your voice, Mr. White. Lower my voice? You sit there and tell me to lower my voice when you have the unadulterated gall, the amazing nerve, the, 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 the one the man you trust to accuse this man of murder? Well, I'm sure Kent can speak for himself. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead now, Kent. I'll tell it. Tell it. Tell this high and mighty nincompoop just where he gets off. Tell him how Jack Roebling tried to steal the rights of his uncle's voice machine and then, out of revenge, smashed it into bits. Now, go ahead, Kent. Tell it. I'm not prepared to make any statement at this time. Oh, for the love of pink turtles, am I going to start raving mad? Now, perhaps you can understand why Kent was apprehended, Mr. White. And why he's being held for further questioning. Now, Kent, can't you listen to me? This so-called servant of the people is going to keep you locked up unless you snap out of it and tell him what's what. Do you want to stay in jail? I'm sorry, Mr. White, but I can't say anything now. Why not? I just can't. All right. All right. Run in jail for all I care. I hope they send you up for 20 years. And on top of everything else, you're fired. <laughs> well, Mr. White has a bit of a temper. I'm not interested in what Mr. White has or hasn't got. Are you going to talk, Kent, or do we have to lock you up again? I'm afraid I haven't anything to say, Mr. Warren. Okay. Monaghan. Yes, sir. Take this man back to his cell. Okay, come on, buddy. Right. When you're ready to talk, Kent, send a message to me through the warden. I'll be glad to. Come on. Uh, Miss Carlyle, get me the mayor's office. Yes, I want to speak to you first. Uh, close the door, Lord, so we won't have to shout over the racket those typewriters are making. Oh, good idea. I don't know why I left it open. Yeah, that's better. Now, as I was saying, Kent has lost his mind. You mean what little he had to lose? Uh, this is no joke, Lois. Now, I told you what happened at the DA's office. He kept repeating over and over again that he had nothing to say. He gods and little fishes. He knows more about that Roebling mix-up than any man on earth. Now, why didn't he open up when that fish-faced Warren practically accused him of murder? Yeah, it does seem strange. Strange? It's insane. Well, at any rate, something's got to be done about it. I couldn't get anywhere with him, and maybe you can. Go down to the city jail. Get a visitor's pass and find out from Kent what in the name of blue monkeys this is all about. But you said a moment ago that you were through with Kent, that you'd fired him. I have, but uh, 
Well, uh, <coughs> well, now go on, go on, go on. Now, now, now do, do, do as I say, do as I say. Uh, what are you waiting for? Okay, Chief. On the way. Shall I give you a log? No! Hey, Mug. No writing on the walls. What do you think this is, an art gallery? Uh, Yeah? What do you want? I just wondered whether you had a prisoner named Benson in the jail. Well, what have we had? Nothing, nothing, except that I read about him in the papers and was curious to know what happened to him. Well, he's still cooped up. Two cells down from this one. Friend of yours? Oh, no, nothing like that. But thanks a lot. Okay. Two cells down, huh? I wonder whether he meant this side or the other side of the corridor. And I'll have to ask him next time he comes by. We have five minutes, Miss Lane. Lois! Well, what brings you here? Oh, just a routine assignment. I'm doing a series called Great Jailbirds of History. Oh, step inside, Miss Lane. Well, well, then, welcome to my, my one-room suite. I, uh, sorry, I uh, haven't had time to put up the drapes yet. Can the comedy talk. Any... Look, I only have five minutes. Now, what's the big idea? Mr. White's having a French fit. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Never Norwegian one before I'm through. <laughs> what's the story? Do you like the atmosphere of this hotel? No. No, no. But I've got to be near someone who's in it. Now, look. You can do something for me. Something important. What? Number one... Get all the information you can on a man named Benson, who's locked up in here now. Yeah. Find out why he was jailed, his connections, and, oh, you know, everything you can lay your hands on. Hey, wait. Then I jot that name down. Benson. That's right. Okay. All right, now, number two, check the files and see if you can locate some dope on a racketeer whose first name is Duke. The chances are you'll find some clips in the, in the morgue at the office. This bird might be a, a big shot in the rackets. What's all this for? I can't tell you now, Lois, but it's important, believe me. Now, wait a minute, Sherlock Holmes. I'm a newspaper reporter, too. Remember? I work for the Daily Planet. Now, look. There's a story in all this mumbo-jumbo you've been going through, and you can't write it because you prefer sitting in jail. I should do it. There isn't any story. Not yet. But there may be. A big one. Sorry, but you'll have to give me more information than just a couple of names. Benson and Duke. I'm not an errand girl. You can trust me, Lois. Yeah, as far as I can throw the Statue of Liberty. I know just what'll happen. I'll run my legs off digging up facts for you, and you'll get all the credit. Uh-uh. Nothing new. All right, I'll tell you. Now, look. There's a man named Benson in jail here. I don't know what crime he committed or, or why they're keeping him here, but he's here. That much you told me a moment hey, ago. Wait, not so loud. This man, Benson, is about to be murdered. You've been reading too many detective story books, Clark. No, this is on the level. That's why I want you to check on Duke. He was the one who arranged to have Benson rubbed out by drawing lots. The assignment fell to a bird they call Curly. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the job was pulled tonight. Not so fast. How can anybody pull a job like that if, if Benson is here in jail? That's the very reason I didn't talk my way out of staying behind bars. I wanted to be here, on the spot, if anything's going to happen. And what, pray tell, could you do, locked up? No, I don't know, but at least I'd have an eyewitness story. It all sounds a little muddled to me, but I'll try and dig up something on Benson and you. Good girl. What'll I do with it if and when I get it? Bring it here. Okay. Still got a minute. How long do you plan keeping this perfectly charming cell? Oh, you like it? You'll be here for any length of time. I'll send you a vacuum cleaner. Oh, thanks, but I don't think I'll need it. My maid comes in every morning and dusts thoroughly. Don't tell me you're going to sleep on that bed. Well, what's the matter with it? The mattress is a trifle lumpy, but it has good strong springs. Look, I'll lift the mattress up and show you. There we are. What's the matter? Look. Attached to one of the springs. What is it? A dictograph. Lois. Are you sure that's what it is? Positive. Someone's been listening to every word I said. Well, the free performance is over. I just ripped the wire out of the microphone. Yeah, does it? You better beat it, Lois, before they decide to hold you, too. Shh. Here comes the guard. Oh. Your five minutes is up, McLean. I'm ready. 
Well, bye, Clark. Bye. I hope everything turns out all right. Oh, I'm sure it will, Lois. Thanks for coming to see me. Bye. Come on. Remember me to Mr. White. I've got to get out of here before they start questioning me about my connection with Benson. That dictograph put a slight crimp in my plan, but I think I can rectify it. Uh, I guess that window up there is the best bet. Only three bars to bend. Superman shouldn't have too much trouble with them. That's one. Two. And three. I guess I can squeeze through that opening. I'll bend the bar straight again once I get out. Uh oh. Someone's coming. Probably for me. I better beat it. In a hurry. Up we go. That's a tight squeeze, all right. There. I'm out. Now to bend the bars back fast. That does it. Now, up. Up. And away. Here's the cell, Monahan. Why, it's empty. Empty? You're crazy. Well, look at it. Now, wait a minute. Something wrong here. I'll open up. Come out from under that bed. There's nobody under the bed. The cell's empty. He busted out. Ring the alarm bell. Hurry. Close all cell blocks. Prisoner escape. Close all cell blocks. Prisoner escape. Get the mayor, get the police commissioner, get my lawyers. I don't care who you get first, just get them. Uh, wait a minute. What happened to my call to the district attorney? What? He's on the wire now. Okay. Hello. Now look, Warren, I'm tired of fooling around with you. Yes, yes, this is Perry White. I don't have to curb my temper. It's mine and I can do as I please with it. Now you listen to me for a change. What kind of a game do you think you're playing? First you tossed Ken into jail and now you're holding Lois Lane. If you think I'm going to stand by and let you pull things like that, you're crazy. What's that? Kent escaped two minutes ago. Broke out of jail. Oh, Warren, <laughs> that's the richest thing I ever heard. A newspaper reporter breaking out of your escape-proof jail. <laughs> oh, <geez>. Hello. <laughs> well, Kent. Uh, goodbye, Warren. Uh, I'll deal with you later. Close that door, you... You hold them. It's all the excitement, Mr. White. No, I'm going crazy here, and you ask what's all the excitement. Now, how did you get out of jail? I walked out. What do you mean you walked out? Okay, I broke out. Then Warren wasn't kidding. You did escape. Well, I suppose you could call it that, technically. Now, Kent, I can't stand much more of this. What in the name of flying fishes is all this about? Why are they holding Lois Lane incommunicado? And why won't they let anyone talk to her? Oh, I was afraid of that. You were afraid of what? Am I an office boy around here? Am I supposed to find out things when they appear in the paper, or what were you afraid of? Why are they holding Lois? Why did you refuse to tell the district attorney your connection with the Roebling case? Well, it's a long story, Mr. White. I don't care if it takes ten years to tell. Out with it. Yes? I have the mayor for you, Mr. White. I don't want the mayor. But you said... I don't care what I said. All right, Kent. Start talking. Well, I don't know whether I should, Mr. White. If you recall, you fired me just before you left the district attorney's office ah, this morning. don't be a fool, Kent. Well, after all, if I'm not in your employ, why... You I... are in my employ. I'll give you a raise. I'll make you editor-in-chief. I'll do anything. But for the love of pink elephants, tell me what this is all about. Okay. I'll make it as brief as possible. You remember when you left Dr. Roebling's house, his voice machine was pretty well smashed up? Well, he repaired it during the night. And early this morning, we tested it. By a strange quirk of fate... As Clark Kent recounts the swiftly moving events of the past few hours... The two men about whom he is talking, Duke and Curly, are meeting in a small private office above the Swan Club. The thick steel door is locked and bolted, and the soundproof walls and ceiling impart a strange hush to their voices. Everything was all set. You toss a brick through the window of a store on State Street, let yourself get nabbed, and the next thing you know, you'll be in the cell right opposite Benson's. It's as easy as all that. Yeah, but how do I get out once I pull the job? Don't worry about that. Uh, it's all right for you to tell me not to worry. Everything's set, didn't you hear me? Yeah, I know, but suppose something don't click. Suppose the works get jammed. They won't get jammed. Leave it to the big guy. Uh, I'd feel better if I knew who the big guy was, Duke. Much better. Nobody cares how you feel. You got a job and you do it, that's all. Yeah, I know, but... If you don't want to do it, we can find someone else. Oh, it ain't that, Duke. I I'll do it, of but... Of course, if we have to find someone else... I don't know how the big guy will feel about you. Chances are he'll figure you can't be trusted. And kind of make plans to see that you don't spill anything. Oh, I never said nothing about not doing it, Duke. You, you know I didn't. Okay. Now, you got everything straight. Yeah. 
I toss a brick through the window of a stall on State Street, get nabbed and show up in a cell opposite Benson. Then what? Then I give it to him and I don't have to worry about getting out. Now you're talking, Curly. Hello? What? The same price symbols was yesterday. Okay, Chief. Yeah. Yeah? No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Right. Forget what I told you, Curly. You mean about busting the window and getting nabbed? Yeah. Someone got wise, so we're switching plans. They're transferring Benson to the state prison at 9 o'clock tonight. Hey, that makes it tough, don't it? No, it makes it easy. You and Spud take the sedan, park somewhere near the jail, and when the car carrying Benson comes out, tail it. There's a nice open stretch of road on the Conway Turnpike, just before you cross the Red River Bridge. You know what to do. Oh, it's in a bag, Duke. That's why it's a cinch. Nine o'clock, huh? Yeah. Get there early. Yeah, sure. Let Spud drive, and you handle the iron. Okay. That's all, Curly. Hey, Duke, before I scram, could I ask you something? What? Well, maybe it ain't none of my business, but every time you talk to the big guy, you say something sounds a little nutsy. Like just now, he must have asked you something, and you said the same price Thimbles was yesterday. Don't make sense. Never mind whether it makes sense or not. Well, it don't mean nothing to me, but I was just wondering because a couple of days ago, I heard you ask him what the price of wool was. You hear too much, Curly. Beat it. Yeah. Sure, I'm going. So long, Duke. So long. And in all probability, Mr. White, that's why they're holding Lois. The dictograph under the mattress was no doubt connected to the district attorney's office, and he heard me telling Lois about the plot to get Benson. Well, there's only one thing I've got to say. I got to give you all the information you needed if I'd known about this before. Benson was city treasurer. What? The district attorney's office nabbed him when an outside audit of his books revealed close to a million dollar shortage. You mean he stole a million dollars of the city's money? I don't know who stole it, but it's missing. Boy. As much as I dislike Warren, I must admit he hopped on it pretty fast. Now, this bird Duke you've been talking about. I'm not sure, but the chances are it's Duke Renard. Who was he? Well, he used to be a small-time gambler when he got into the building racket. Warren nabbed him, too, not so long ago. Yeah? He had a hand in the contract for the new courthouse, caught supplying inferior material, and fined $85,000. Well, this all confirms my thoughts. Evidently, Duke Renard is still involved in the racket. Benson knows too much for Duke's health and the health of the man higher up. That's why they're after him. Yeah. yeah I'll take it. Where are you talking? Who? Yeah, just a minute. For you, Kent. Oh, thanks. Hello. Oh, yes, Dr. Roebling. Yes? What? You did? Oh, yes. Hold on a second, will you? I'll, I'll get a pencil and paper. Okay. Yes? Nine o'clock. Conway Turnpike. Uh-huh. Yeah. What? What's the other name? Spud? Yeah, I've got it. Mm-hmm. Oh, he did, eh? I see. Yes, well, thanks a lot, Dr. Roebling. Yeah. What? In jail? Oh, no, no, I I uh, talked myself out of it. Okay, goodbye. That was Dr. Roebling. He was fooling around with his I think I voice. can tackle this on my own. Well, who do you think you are? Superman? Uh, well, not exactly. Oh, not exactly. Now, don't be a stupid fool. I wouldn't mess with Duke Renard's gang of hoodlums unless I had half the police force behind me. They don't frighten you, Mr. White. I've dealt with their kind before. I know, but one bullet and the deal's over. You don't get any second chance. What was the exact conversation Dr. Roebling picked up on his voice machine? Well, he didn't give it to me word for word, but the gist of it was that Benson was being transferred from the city jail to state prison at 9 o'clock tonight. Yes? Yeah? Two of Renard's men, Curly and Spud... We're assigned to see that he never reaches state prison alive. Uh-huh. They're going to stop the car Benson rides in on the Conway Turnpike just before it reaches the Red River Bridge. Yeah, and you want to tackle them alone. Ah, you're out of your mind, Kent. But I'm calling the DA's office. No, no, wait a minute. Nothing doing. If you call the DA, Mr. White, Benson's goose is cooked. What do you mean? Just this. Benson is a marked man because someone is afraid he's going to talk. That someone is the big guy, the higher up who gives Duke Renard orders. Mm, doesn't take a genius to figure that out. Well, all right. Now, the original plan, according to what Dr. Roebling and I heard over the voice machine, was to send Curly right into the city jail to do the job on Benson. However, suddenly, someone decides to switch Benson to the state prison. Why? Well, you tell me. I will tell you. 
It was Warren, the district attorney, who ordered Benson transferred. After he heard me tell Lois, Benson was on the spot. After he listened in to our conversation over the dictograph. So what? Do you blame him for getting Benson out of the city jail and sending him someplace where he'd be safe? Well... After all, if anyone knows who robbed the city of that million dollars, Benson does. Dead men can't talk. Exactly. Now the question is, how did Duke Renard learn Benson is being transferred to the state prison at 9 o'clock tonight? Who tipped him off? Hmm, I never thought of that. Did the big guy tell him? If he did, who is the big guy? Kent, you don't think Warren... Well, it's happened before, hasn't it? 99% of city, state, and government officials are honest as the day is long. But every once in a while, a crooked one crops up. Ah, that's ridiculous, Kent. Warren can't have any connection with Renard. He was the one who got the indictment against Henry Benson. Well... He was the one who nabbed Renard in that building scandal and hooked him with a fat $85,000 fine. I know, but I still don't think it's safe to tell him too much. Not until we're sure. Sure of what? Well, sure of where we stand. If I can lay my hands on either Curly or Spud or both of them, we might get some valuable information. As it is, we know that Renard uses some sort of identifying code when he talks to the big guy. You never told me about any code. Well, I just heard it once. But Dr. Roebling said he used it again this afternoon. What sort of code? I don't know yet. I haven't figured it out, but when Renard called the big guy this morning, the first thing he said was, what are you getting for fish today? Evidently, the big guy's identifying answer was all right, because Renard's next words were, okay, chief. What are you getting for fish today? Yeah. Are you sure it's code? It must be. Dr. Roebling said the call this afternoon came to Renard, and his first words were, the same price we got for thimbles yesterday. I'm beginning to think you and Roebling are ready for straitjackets. This is all on the level, Mr. White. That's why it's so important not to let any of our plans leak out, even to the district attorney. What's going on out there? I don't know. I'll see. Here we are, mister. Ah, we tried to keep them out, Mr. White, but they pulled guns. Shut up. Wait a minute, you two. Just because you're wearing police uniforms, you have no right to bust in here. Oh, no? Who are you? I'm the editor of this paper, and... Wait, that's on him, Joe. Right? Keep your hands off me. Kent! Oh, so you're Clark Kent. No, my name is Elmer Brown. Don't kid me. They got your mitts. I tell you, my name is Brown. I heard him call you Kent. Come on. Uh, Don't resist. Let him arrest us. I'll sue them from here to Singapore. I'll make them pay through the nose. You wait and see. Okay, now hike. Go ahead, Joe, and clear that gang of rubbernecks out of the way. Stand back, sir. Come on, come on. You heard me. Get back. All right. Come on, you Ms. do. Miss Barber. Miss Barber, call my lawyer. Tell him to meet me at the district attorney's office. Oh, I don't blame you. You're just a couple of cops who have to take orders. <laughs> yeah, that's a hot one, ain't it, Joe? Yeah, I'll make it hot for your boss. You can bet on that. <laughs> Listen to him. You're wasting breath, Mr. White. They're not city policemen. What? No, and they're not taking us to the district attorney's office, either. We're going in the opposite direction. You ain't so dumb, Kent. But but, but why? What's the idea? Calm what down, you... Grandpa. Who are these men, Kent? Probably two of Duke Renard's boys. You know too much for your own good, Kent. Give it a gun, Joe. Okay. And remember, Grandpa, and you too, wise guy... I'm watching every move you make. Okay, last stop. Get out. Where are we? Never mind. Get out. Come on, Mr. White. Now, through that door up the steps. Lead the way, Joe. You follow him, Grandpa. If I didn't have these handcuffs on, I'd show you who's our Grandpa. <laughs> yeah, bet you're handy with your dukes. But right now, get going. You'd better, Mr. White. Open the door, Joe. Come on, stop stalling. Move. Okay, inside. Here they are, Duke. Both of them. Nice work, Curly. Come in, gentlemen. Oh, so you're Curly. Yeah, I'm Curly. Any objection? That'll be enough. Get those uniforms off and wait outside, you and Spud. Okay. So long, Grandpa. Why, you dirty little... Your name's White, isn't it? Yes, and you're Clark Kent. Sit down, both of you. I prefer standing. I said sit down. I guess you know who I am. I'm warning you, Renard. You're carrying things too far. I'm not a cheap politician who can be reached with a few dollars. I know you're kind, Shut up. You can't tell me to shut up. Shut up or I'll jam your tongue down your throat. Around here, I give the orders. Understand? Don't argue with him, Mr. White. No, it ain't smart. All right, but there'll be a reckoning. And when there is, you'll pay and pay heavily. (laughs) Don't make me laugh. What do you want with us, Renard? Nothing much. I just like your company. You might as well come out with it. I said I just like your company. 
You're going to sit with me until maybe 10, 10.30 tonight. Oh, I see. What do you see? Uh-huh. We're going to sit with you until 10 or 10.30. You figure it'll take about an hour or an hour and a half. What'll take an hour, an hour and a half? A little job you're engineering. Yes. A little job of murder. <laughs> Both you wise guys got good imaginations. You've been going to the movies too much. It ain't healthy. What you're doing isn't healthy either. Never mind about me. I can take care of myself. Now, just relax. Uh, you just wait until I get out of here. Just wait. I'll run you and your hoodlums out of town if it's the last thing I do. Relax, brother. Relax. You've got a long wait. Have I? You might be mistaken. I don't think so. Not this time. Today? Today is Friday. And if you're not behind bars by Sunday, I'll eat my hat. <laughs> well, you better start chewing, pal. What time is it, Renard? Five o'clock. You've got a good long stretch ahead of you. Now, this wouldn't have happened if your nose wasn't so long. Oh, you're right. And it wouldn't have happened if you weren't doing somebody else's dirty work. That's my business, mister. Yes, and it's bad business, Renard. You're just a sucker. Watch what you're saying. You know it as well as I do. You're a sucker for the big guy. Shut up. You'll take the rap if anything happens. The big guy won't. I said shut up. You'll go to the chair for murder. All right, you asked for it. Now, will you keep that big mouth shut, or do I have to smack you around a little? (laughs) Too bad we're not in this room alone, Renard. Just you and I. You wouldn't be so free with your hands. You talk big, blabbermouth. At least he's not a yellow dog. He doesn't hit a man whose wrists are handcuffed. That's enough out of you. You're lower than a snake's belt. I said that's enough out of you. You see this little gadget? It's a blackjack. One tap behind the ear and you're out for a long time. Don't say anything, Mr. White. I'm not going to sit here and take his foul abuse. I don't think we'll be sitting here very long. Oh, no? No. I just happened to think of something. Do you mind if I send a friend of mine a message, Renard? Are you nuts? No. No, just hopeful. You can listen to the message. Dr. Roebling. Huh? Dr. Roebling, this is Clark Kent. A man named Duke Renard is holding Mr. White and myself prisoners... What's this? ...on the second floor of a frame house located at 10th Street and Marlowe Avenue. This guy's crazy. Dr. Roebling, a man named (laughs) Duke Renard is holding... Gambling on the chance that Dr. Roebling is listening in on his voice machine, Kent, to the amusement of Duke Renard... Dr. Roebling? Dr. Roebling, <laughs> Mr. White and I are being held prisoners on the second floor of a frame house at 10th Street and Marlowe Avenue. Inform the police at once. Oh, you're nuts, Ken. Who do you think you're talking to? I get this way every once in a while, Renard. I have hallucinations. What have you got? Hallucinations? He thinks he's a radio station. Yes, that's it. I'm a radio station. Oh, yeah, I see. You're a radio station. Yes. You're, you're broadcasting. Uh-huh. Huh? Yes, I, I like to broadcast. Well, go ahead. Have a good time, but not too loud. The neighbors don't like nobody to broadcast too loud. Oh, no, I won't broadcast too loud. (laughs) Dr. Roebling. Dr. Roebling. Who is this guy, Dr. Roebling? Does he like to broadcast too? No, he receives. Oh, yeah. When you broadcast, he listens in. Is that it? That's right. (laughs) Where is this guy, Dr. Roebling? Oh, miles from here. But when you broadcast like this, he can hear you, can't he? (laughs) He can if he's listening. Oh, yeah, of course he's listening. Go ahead, broadcast. (laughs) All right. Dr. Roebling, Mr. White and I are being held prisoners by a man named Duke Renard. We are on the second floor of a frame house. How many times do you have to broadcast that? Oh, well, maybe 20 times, maybe 100. You see, I can't tell when he'll begin listening. Oh, I get it. He ain't always tuned into your broadcasting station, is he? Oh, of course not. <laughs> well, what's so funny? Oh, wait a minute, Ken. I want to get Curly to hear you broadcasting. <laughs> Hey, Curly! Yeah, come, come in a minute. <laughs> What's up? Ken here is broadcasting. He's what? Yeah, he's a radio station, Curly. Go ahead, Ken. Show, show Curly how you how you broadcast. Uh, don't do it, Ken. <laughs> They're just making fun of you. Oh, come on, Ken. Curly will go for it big. <laughs> Be a good guy. Show him how you broadcast. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Dr. Roebling, this is Clark Kent talking. Listen to this, Curly. <laughs> Mr. White and I are being held prisoners on the second floor of a frame house at 10th Street and Marlowe Avenue. Notify the police at once. Is that something, Curly? I don't get it, Duke. You don't get it. Get the radio station. He's broadcasting. How? (laughs) Unaware that Clark Kent is attempting to establish contact with Dr. Roebling's voice machine, an amazing instrument capable of picking up sound waves no matter where created, Duke Renard, suspecting Kent of being mentally unbalanced, urges him to repeat the message over and over again. 
Meanwhile, at District Attorney Warren's office, Perry White's lawyers are still demanding attention. Now what? Mr. White's lawyers are still waiting, Mr. Warren. I told you, they can wait until doomsday. But they say unless you produce Mr. White immediately, they'll get rid of habeas corpus. Well, how can I produce him if I don't know where he is? Did you tell them the police of this city have no knowledge of his arrest? Yes, but... All right, tell them to find him and bring him to me. Then I'll produce him. Yes, Mr. Warren, I'll tell them. Monaghan. Yes, sir? Get Miss Lane. Bring her here. Yes, sir. Uh, Miss Carroll. Yes, Mr. Warren. Come in here. I want you to take some notes. Yes, sir. Uh, Miss Carroll, Monaghan is bringing Miss Lane up. You know who she is, don't you? Yes, a reporter on the Daily Planet. She knows about Kent breaking out of jail, but she hasn't heard the latest development. The story of the two phony cops who arrested Kent and White, the editor. Frankly, I don't believe that, Mr. Warren. I mean, the story. Sounds like typical newspaper stuff. Yes, you may be right. But at any rate, I'm going to question this Lane girl, and you make notes of all her answers. Very well. All right, she comes now. Oh, sit down, Miss Lane. Thank you. That'll be all, Monaghan. Yes, sir. This is my secretary, Miss Carroll. How do you do? How do you do? When did this farce end, Mr. Warren? The moment we're sure it's a farce and not a serious matter. Perhaps you're ready to tell me how Kent knew about a plot against Henry Benson's life. For the tenth time, I know as much about it as you do. We both heard what Kent said. I heard it personally, and you heard it through that planted dictograph. But I didn't hear enough. If somebody was plotting to get rid of Benson before we could get him to talk, where did a newspaper reporter come by the information? We get around. Yes, perhaps a little too much. That's a matter of opinion. Well, there are some things that aren't a matter of opinion. And one of them is that you and your partner, Kent, are heading for trouble and plenty of it. In fact, both Kent and your editor, Perry White, have already disappeared. Really? Yes, really. Two men posed as police officers drove off with both Kent and White. They haven't been heard from since. Are you trying to pull a fast one? Not at all, Miss Lane. Will you let me talk to Mr. White's secretary? Of course. Here's the phone. Just ask for the number. Metropolis 3500, please. When did this happen? About an hour ago. And you say two phony police... Uh, Miss Barber, please. Lois Lane speaking. Yes, two men dressed in police uniforms, according to the information received from your office. Hello, Anne. This is Lois. What happened? Yes. Yes. Both of them? Oh, I see. No, no, I'm still at the district attorney's office. I don't know. Yes, I'll call you. Okay. Well, Miss Lane? You're right. Well, my being right doesn't help the situation. To begin with, Kent is a fugitive from justice, an escaped prisoner. That's a lot of nonsense. You know he had nothing to do with the girls being shot. Her husband did it. Fortunately for Kent, the husband confessed late this afternoon. But that doesn't excuse Kent's breaking out of jail. Now, where is he? And where is Perry White? If I knew, Mr. Warren, I wouldn't be sitting here. You seem to forget that you're under arrest, Miss Lane. That's a lot of nonsense, too. I'm afraid it's a lot more serious than you believe. As a matter of fact, you won't be released until you explain how Kent learned an attempt was going to be made to wipe out Henry Benson. I told you I don't know. That doesn't ring true, Miss Lane. I don't care how it rings. Now, look. Are you going to sit there asking me ridiculous questions instead of doing something about finding Mr. White and Mr. Kent? Where do you think they are? Would you really like to know? Naturally. I wonder. What do you mean? You know exactly what I mean. Miss Lane, if you have anything to say, I'd advise you to say it. Anything I might have to say, Mr. Warren, would be quite personal. I doubt very much whether your secretary would be concerned. I'll leave if you wish, Mr. Warren. Stay right where you are, Miss Carroll. Like all newspaper reporters, Miss Lane is merely bluffing. Oh, I am, am I? All right. You ask for it, you'll get it. You know where Mr. White and Mr. Kent are. You know exactly where they are. That story of two men dressed up in police uniforms doesn't hold water. Detective book stuff. What are you talking about? You and your staff were the only ones who knew Clark Kent had broken out of jail. Naturally, you figured he'd go right to the Daily Planet office, so you sent two policemen to pick him up. And while they were at it, they arrested Mr. White. I've already told you, Miss Lane, the Metropolis Police Department had nothing to do with that incident. Absolutely nothing. Miss Carroll, you checked with Commissioner Blaine, didn't you? Yes, Mr. Warren. What did he tell you? He said there was no record of any arrests made at the Daily Planet office. Thank you. That doesn't prove anything. If you weren't responsible for arresting them, who was? Miss Lane, if I knew the answer to that question, a great deal of your time and my time would be saved. Unfortunately, I don't. Take that, Miss Carroll. Mm -hmm. Mr. Warren's office? Yes. Yes, just a moment. Police Commissioner Blaine. Oh, thank you. 
Hello, Commissioner. Yes. What's that? Well, that sounds like a crank, doesn't it? Oh, I see. He mentioned her name, did he? Well, she's right here in my office. Hold on a minute. You know a Dr. Roebling, Miss Lane? Dr. Roebling? Why, why, yes, he's an inventor. Commissioner, yes. Yes, she knows him. Oh, naturally not. I see. Well, I imagine the safest thing to do is to send a couple of squad cars down. I'll go along in case there's anything to it. Right, goodbye. Who is this Dr. Roebling, Miss Lane? An inventor. He just called police headquarters and said he'd received a message from Kent. On his voice machine. What was that? Uh, nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, the message said that Kent and White were being held on the second floor of a building at 10th Street and Marlowe Avenue. He's probably just a crank, Mr. Warren. Yes, I mentioned that to Blaine, but he didn't seem to think so. If Dr. Roebling said he got a message, he got it. Well, what are you waiting for? You're really not going to waste any time on it, are you, Mr. Warren? Well, I might as well check it. Call the garage, have a car brought around. Yes, Mr. Warren. Is there anything else? No, that's all. Thank you. I'm afraid that you'll have to go back to the detention pen, Miss Lane. Well, why can't I go with you? After all, I am a reporter. I know, but if this lead is reliable, there may be trouble. Serious trouble. According to Dr. Roebling, the message said Kent and White were being held by Duke Renard. And he's dangerous. That doesn't frighten me. I'm sorry, Miss Lane, but women and bullets don't mix. Mr. Warren, you're not being honest with me. That isn't the reason you won't let me go along with you, and... <laughs> Dr. Roebling. Dr. Roebling. Listen to this, Carly. <laughs> this is Clark Kent. Mr. White and I are being held on the second floor of a frame house at 10th Street and Marlowe Avenue. You see, Carly? <laughs> Notify the police at once. I don't get it, Duke. What's a gag? There ain't no gag. He really means it. <laughs> What's he shooting his mouth off for? Who's he expect to hear that stuff? He's broadcasting, Carly. <laughs> broadcasting? Don't you understand? He's making out he's a radio station, and he's broadcasting a message to a pal of his, a guy named Roebling. <laughs> What's the matter with him? Nuts? Now, Curly, that ain't a nice thing to say about Mr. Kent. Did you hear what Curly said, Mr. Kent? It really doesn't matter. Of course not. If you want to be a broadcasting station, you go right ahead. <laughs> Dr. Roebling. Listen Dr. Roebling. <laughs> this is Clark Kent. Notify the police that Mr. White and myself are being held in a house at 10th Street and Marlowe Avenue by Duke Renard. Now, ain't that something, Curly? Ever heard anything like it? No, not me. Go ahead, Kent. We like it, Curly and me. Oh, I'm finished, thank you. Oh, now, come on. Just because Curly don't believe you're a radio station, you don't mean you're going to stop. No, I think I've done enough, thanks. Dr. Roebling was listening. He'll have the police here shortly. Oh, I see. If he was listening, he'll call the cops and tell them about it. Yes, that's the general idea. <laughs> you don't have much respect for the cops in this town, do you, Kent? What do you mean? You think the Metropolis cops are dumb enough to fall for a crackpot story about some guy getting a message through the air? Well, I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, Renard. I'm sure Dr. Roebling will be capable of explaining how he received the message. Yeah, I'll bet. I'd give a hundred bucks just to hear this Roebling bozo explain how you're sitting here with bracelets on your wrists, spouting messages to him, and how he's hearing them 20 miles away. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be something. Don't you think so, White? I'm thinking only one thing, Renard. But the sooner you are behind the bars, the better I like it. Then Kent can send me messages. <laughs> Providing I'm listening. You'll get a message, all right, from the judge. It'll say 20 years to life. Or maybe even the electric chair. No, no, no. Don't excite yourself, Mr. White. It isn't worth it. Sure, keep calm. You live longer. For the love of heaven, Kent, how can you sit there and tell me not to excite myself when you know what this means? It's a matter of life or death for Henry Benson. What are you talking about? You know exactly what I'm talking about. You and your hoodlums are planning to murder Henry Benson at 9 o'clock tonight when they transfer him from city jail to the state prison. You're rubbing him out to keep him quiet. Somebody's been telling you stories, Pop. Yes, but they're true stories, Renard. That's what you think. No, neither Mr. White nor I have to think. We know. You drew lots to pick a man to go into the city jail and kill Benson. Curly was elected. Now, wait a minute. Let me finish. The district attorney's office found out about that little plan and decided to transfer Benson to the state prison. Someone, probably the big guy who gives you orders, tipped you off that the transfer is being made at 9 o'clock tonight. And so Curly and Spud are to follow the car Benson will be riding in and put an end to him. Who told you all this? I got it from a very reliable source. There's only one thing missing. Why does your boss, the big guy, want to get rid of Henry Benson? You tell me. I'll tell you. Because your boss is mixed up in the million-dollar shortage the auditors found in the city treasury. And although Benson was city treasurer and responsible for the shortage, 
The big guy had a hand in it, and he's afraid Benson might break down and talk. Like I said before, you've been going to too many movies. Well, we didn't get all this information from movies, Renard. Every bit of it is true, and you know it. Don't either of you move if you want to live. Hello? The same price Thimbles was yesterday. Okay, boss. What? No kidding. How'd it happen? As the phone rings yeah. and Duke Renard lifts the receiver yeah. from the hook, Clark Kent leans yeah. forward in his chair yeah. and, making use of Superman's acute hearing, uh -huh. manages to pick up a woman's voice coming over the wire. What's the difference how it happened? Stop asking silly questions and listen to me. Okay. Two squad cars left here about three minutes ago. Warren followed them with some detectives. We'd better scram in a hurry. What about these two guys? What two guys? Kent and White from the newspaper. They know plenty. What can they know? Everything. The whole setup. Then get rid of them. We can't afford to take any chances now. You mean... You know what I mean. Get rid of them. Okay. Now listen. Call me as soon as you locate somewhere. Right. Curly. Yeah, boss. Someone tip the cops. They're on the way here. Uh, what did I tell you? Don't worry, Pop. It won't do you no good. Curly, tell Spud to start the car and get me a couple of hunks of rope. Okay. So, the police have finally caught up with you, Renard. Not yet, buddy. It's a long way from headquarters out here. we still got time. Your goose is cooked, Renard. Not mine, Pop. Yours. Here's a rope, Duke. Good. Tie up the old guy. I'll take care of Kent. You keep your hands off me. Pipe down, Grandpa, or I'll slug you. No. Don't have to go to all this Jamie. trouble, Renard. We can't follow you, not with these handcuffs on. I just want to make sure you don't bust loose when things start to get a little hot. There we are. That'll hold you. Hold on, Curly. Yep. Okay, let's go. So long. Why, that low-down snake in the grass. I'd just like to get my hands on him once, that's all. Now, now, don't exert yourself, Mr. White. You can't loosen that rope. Oh, now, who do you suppose called him to tell him the police were on the way? It was a woman, Mr. White. Huh? Uh, what? Well, how do you know? I heard her voice over the wire. She told him exactly how many cars were coming, three in all. Two squad cars and one with a district attorney and some detectives. You mean to say you heard all that? Oh, yes, she uh, had rather a loud voice. Well, uh, I didn't hear a thing. I guess I am getting old. But anyway, what good does it do us? Renard and his pack of vermin are gone. We'll catch up with them. The important thing is that they won't dare try to get Benson tonight. At least we accomplish... What's the matter? I smell smoke. Yeah, so do I. Well, look. Huh. Look, Kent, it's coming up through the cracks in the floor. Is that... Well, what is it? Now I know what Renard meant when he said he wanted to make sure we didn't bust loose when things started to get a little hot. The house is on fire. Well, no, no, it can't be. That's what it is. The floor is getting warm. We can't. What do we do? Now try to loosen this rope. <laughs> it's burned alive. But... No, we won't. Now just keep your head, Mr. White. Ah, there. Renard needs a lesson in rope tying. Now I can free you even with these handcuffs on. <laughs> Wait a minute. Listen. Flames crackling. We've got to hurry. Hold still. We'll never get out, Kent. We're doomed. Now, don't be silly. There, you're free. There you are. Yeah, now what? Wait, I'll, I'll try this door. No, it's locked. Kent, our only chance is out the window. The place is an inferno. I can feel the heat coming up through the floor. Oh, I think I can force this door. Stand back, will you? Once more, I'll do it. There we are. No, Kent. Look. The hall is blazing. Boy, it is hot. All oh, the flame is being sucked into the room now. The jump can. Out the window. Wait a minute, Mr. White. Wait, you can't do that. There's a stone pavement below. You may crack your skull. It's better than being burned alive. Let go, my eye. I won't let you jump. Let go, I said. Please, Mr. White. Let go, let go. Oh, I can do this, but it's the only way. Oh. There. Now we can go out the window, Mr. White. You and Superman. Oh, here come the squad cars. I don't want them to spot me because there's work to do tonight. Up with the window. Out. And up. Up. And away. Slow down, Spud. Pull up at that gas station and fill the tank. I gotta make a call. Okay, Duke. Keep an eye out for cops, Curly. I'll be right back. Don't worry. Where's the phone booth, Spud? Uh, right inside, mister. You want some gas? Yeah, fill her up. The boys in the car will pay you. Okay. Hello. 
What are you getting for fish today? Same place we got the symbols yesterday. Where are you, Duke? About ten miles out of Metropolis. I'm calling from a gas station. What happened? Everything's okay. Are you sure? Positive. Good. Now listen to me. It's 7.20 now. Benson is leaving the city jail at 8 instead of 9. How come? Never mind. There'll be two deputies in the car, one at the wheel and one sitting with Benson. Okay. Where are you going to head the car off? Near the Red River Bridge. All right. But remember, this time it's got to be right. Don't worry, it will. Call me at the other number as soon as you're through. Right. So long. So long. Okay, girlie? Yeah. Let's go, then. Where to, Duke? The Conway Turnpike just before the Red River Bridge and make it fast. Now, what's the hurry? Benson ain't leaving the jail till nine. He's leaving at eight. We got 30 minutes to get there. Are you coming along, Duke? Yeah. I gotta be sure this job is done right. Step on it, Spud. What right you had to fall off and suck me? I can't even talk. Sorry, Mr. White, but it was the only way. You wanted to jump out the window. Certainly a slightly painful jaw is better than a couple of broken legs. Mm, I wonder. Who would you hit me with, a sledgehammer? No, just my fist. It's for your own good. Next time, try not to be so good to me. Oh. Well, if you'll just keep that ice bag on the swelling, I'm sure it'll go down. Mm, I don't know why I haven't sent you packing. Incidentally, uh, how did we get out of that burning building? Why, uh, uh, through the hall. Through the hall? Yes. You're crazy. It's like the inside of a furnace. Oh, well, I, uh, I managed to find an opening where there wasn't any flame. What happened to the police? Did they ever get there? Oh, yes, yes, just as we left. Uh, did Warren, the district attorney, see you? No, I slipped around the back of the house, hailed a taxi cab, and brought you to the office. I don't know, Kent. Sometimes I can't figure you out. The stories you tell are a little fantastic. Well, now, there's certainly nothing fantastic about hailing a cab, is there? No, but I saw that hallway. It was blazing. And yet, you carried me through it, down the steps, around to the back of the house, and hailed a cab. All without even scorching a shoe. Uh, well, what's the difference? We've certainly made a mess of things. Instead of rounding up Duke Renard and his gang of cutthroats, we came close to losing our lives. Oh, we'll round them up yet. Benson is being transferred from the city jail at 9 o'clock. Renard's men are going to intercept the car on the Conway Turnpike. I'll be there to see that they don't. Oh, don't be a stupid fool. That's a job for the police. I'm not going to be responsible for anything happening to you. Now, look, we've gone through all that, Mr. White. Nothing's going to happen to me. I've got it all figured out. What do you mean? There'll be two jail guards in the car with Benson. One at the wheel and one in the back seat. I'm going to be the third. The third what? The third guard. There's only one difficulty. I, I need a uniform. Uh, are you mad, Kent? What is all this nonsense? It isn't nonsense, Mr. White. If I can get a prison guard's uniform, I'll make the trip in Benson's car. Naturally, knowing that Duke Renard's men are lying in wait for us, I'll be in a position to handle them. Why can't the police do it? You're a newspaper reporter, not a cop. At least, I'm paying you to be a reporter. Oh, you get your money's worth in an exclusive story, an eyewitness account of an attempt made on Henry Benson's life. Sure, sure. Unless you stop a bullet. Well, if I stop a bullet, it'll stay stopped. Uh, uh, what? Uh, well, I, uh, I mean, I, I won't get in the way of any bullets. Uh, that's a bright remark. I suppose if one of those mugs fires point blank at you, you'll just catch the bullet and flip it back at him, huh? Uh, I'm afraid only Superman can do that, Mr. White. Ah, Superman. You're beginning to sound like that copy boy, Jimmy Olsen. Uh, well, that's not getting us anywhere. The point is simply this, Mr. White. Someone is trying to silence Henry Benson for fear he'll spill the beans about that million-dollar shortage. Yeah, that much I know. All right. Now, I told you earlier this evening that I suspected District Attorney Warren. Yes, and I told you you were crazy. Warren prepared the case against Benson, and Warren hooked Duke Renard with an $85,000 fine and some crooked building deal. Well, you may be right. Probably Warren himself isn't involved, but someone on the inside is. Otherwise, Renard wouldn't be tipped off to confidential information the way he is. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I seem to remember you are telling me that a woman called Renard and warned him that the police were closing in. That's right. Well, how does a woman get mixed up in this? Well, I don't know. But whoever she is, she certainly has some way of knowing what's going on. That's why it might be dangerous to tell the police about this nine o'clock affair. You see, it may get back to Renard that the police are wise, and, well, then where are we? Well, you may have something there. What do you propose to do again? Get hold of a prison guard's uniform, present myself as representing the state prison, and go along in the car with Benson and the two guards. And where do you think you can find a uniform at this hour? Yeah, that's the problem. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I've got a friend in the theatrical costuming business. He carries all kinds of uniforms. Oh, they're leaving the city jail with Benson at nine, is that right? Yes, we've got just about an hour. It's ten of eight now. Okay, I'll call him. Oh, the uh, switchboard is closed, Mr. White. You'll have to dial the number. Yeah, well, I remember it. 
Now, let's see. Uh, Metropolis 4873, I think that's it. M E 4 H. As Editor White attempts to contact his friend in the theatrical costume business, unaware that the hour of Henry Benson's departure from the city jail has been changed from nine to eight, the car carrying Duke Renard and his two henchmen, Curly and Spud, turns off the Conway Turnpike and comes to a stop on a well-hidden wagon road. Okay, there's a fine. Shut off the motor. What time is it, Duke? Just eight. Well, that means we got a good 40 minutes. It'll take him that long to get here. Turn on the radio. Get some music. You mind if I cop a little snow, Duke? No, go ahead, Spud. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jack Ransom bringing you the latest up-to-the-minute news. You want to hear the news, Duke? Yeah, keep it on. Metropolis. Local police and fire officials are trying to explain the cause of the mysterious blaze that leveled a two-story frame house at 10th Street on Marlowe Avenue early this evening. Hey, listen to that. Shut up. Police have been tipped off that the house was being occupied by Duke Renard, wanted for questioning in the Benson case. However, upon arrival, they found it in flames. Residents of the neighborhood reported to the police that they had seen a black sedan parked outside the house for more than an hour before the fire started. Police are in possession of the license number, but have not yet revealed the car's ownership. District Attorney Warren, in a statement issued at the scene of the fire, said he would order an investigation. Hey, they got our license number, Duke. What do we do? Turn that off. But you hear what he said? I heard it. I mean about the license number. That's not what bothers me. He didn't say anything about Kent and White. No, nothing at all. They couldn't have gotten loose. Well, no, not a chance. But if they did, there'll be trouble. What do you mean? Kent knows we got Benson on the spot. If he tips the cops, we won't have a chance. There'll be a million of them following that car. Now, what do we do? Now, wait a minute. I gotta think. Uh, I don't like mixing with cops. Not out here. You won't have to mix with them. That bridge up ahead is a draw, isn't it? It's a what? A draw bridge. It opens up to let boats through. Yeah, I think so. Well, if it is, I got the answer. We can get Benson without even pulling a gun. How? I'll show you. Wake up, Spud. Hey, what's the matter? Drive the car across the bridge. Park off the road on the other side. Okay. What do you got up your sleeve, Duke? You'll see. Take it easy, Spud. Keep your lights down. Right. Yeah, it's a drawbridge, all right. The kind that opens sideways. Ah, that suits me swell. I don't get it, Duke. Hold your horses. Okay, Spud, this is far enough. Pull off the road. Kill the motor. Turn the lights out. You stick with the car, Spud. Curly's coming with me. What's the setup? I'm going to tell you. The car carrying Benson has got to cross this bridge to get to the state prison, see? Yeah. Well, instead of taking any chances on shooting it out with cops, we're going to drop that car into the river. Drop the car into the river? How? You see that little house back on the bridge on the right-hand side? Yeah, I see it. That's the bridge keeper's house. He's the guy who opens and shuts the drawer when a boat goes through. Sometimes there's two guys, but it don't matter. No, I still don't get it, Duke. Ah, you got a head like a tack. We're going to take over the bridge, and when the car with Benson in it comes rolling along, we'll open the bridge up, and the car will drop into the river. <laughs> uh, uh, you sure are smart, Duke. Yeah, and how? If we handle it right, it won't matter how many cops are following that car. They won't even be able to cross the bridge, because it'll be open, and we can make an easy getaway. Oh, that can't miss. Uh, there's only one thing. What? How do we know which is Benson's car? Two ways. Number one, it'll be a sheriff's car with a red light on it. Number two, we can figure the time. It left the jail at 8. That means it'll hit this bridge at about 8.40. Come on, we've got to work fast. Follow me, Curly. Keep your gun handy. Right. I only see one guy in the house, Duke. He's an old geezer. Yeah. I guess he's alone. Well, that makes it easier. Wait a minute. Yeah. We're not going to mess around with the guy in the house. What do you mean? We can't take any chances. He's liable to knock over a telephone or maybe press a button that'll jam the whole works. So what do we do? Slug him fast. I'll go in first and you sneak in behind me. Just tap him with the butt of your gun. Not too hard, but enough to put him to sleep. Okay. Come on. All right, here's the door. Hey. He's reading the magazine. This will be a cinch. You ready? Yeah. Let's go. Good evening. Let him have it, Curly. Huh? Oh, he's out cold. Good. Ah, let's see how these levers work. This one's marked open, full speed. Yeah, I guess that means the draw. Well, here goes. All right, Spud. Yeah, 
right, Curly. Let's test these levers just to make sure we know how to run it. This one says, open, full speed. You watch the bridge through the window. Okay. All set? Yeah, let her ride. Hey, she's open like a pair of scissors. Let me look. Yeah, that does it. I guess you'll stop when you push the lever back. Open up as wide as she'll go, Duke. Nah, that's far enough. We don't want to jam anything. And she stops. Before there's a whole day, you can drop five trucks through. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? See them big red lights blinking on both sides of the bridge? Yeah, they must go on automatically when the draw's open. Then we better put them out. Whoever's driving that sheriff's car will stop on a dime when he sees them red lights. Yeah, you're right. I'll close the draw and you go out and put a couple of slugs in the lights. This must be the lever. It says close, full speed. Well, here goes. That's the ticket. She's closing. Okay, turn her off. Take care of those lights. You better tell Spud out in the car or he'll think the shooting means something. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. You better take this old guy out to the car. He's liable to come to and set up an awful howl. And anyway, it won't look good for the bridge keeper to be laying here out cold in case a car stops to ask directions or something. Yeah, you're right. Tell Spud there's some rope in the trunk. You can tie the guy up, gag him, and toss him in the back seat. Get him under the arms and drag him. He ain't heavy. Okay. I got him. Don't waste any time. Get back here fast. All right. Now, let's see if I got these levers right. This one with the red handle opens the drawer, and this one with the green handle closes it. Red opens, green closes. That ought to be easy enough. And what time is it? 8.30. Ten more minutes, and the sheriff's car should come rolling along. There goes one red light. I sure hope there's some cops following Benson's car. Won't the big mouths pop open when they see they can't get over the bridge? <laughs> I'd like to stick around just to watch him. Light number two. Now we're all set. Okay? And dead eye dick, that's me. Two shots, two lights. I heard him. Spud taking care of the old guy? Yeah, he's keeping the car motor running for a quick getaway. <laughs> that's all right, but we won't need no quick getaway. The bridge will be wide open. If there's any cops, they'll need wings to get across. Oh, hey, that's a hot one. Cops with wings. <laughs> all right, come on. We only got ten minutes. I want to test the levers again. Stand by the window. Okay. Let her ride. There she goes. While Duke Renard tests the drawbridge for the last time, preparing to work the diabolical plan that will mean death by drowning for whoever is riding in the sheriff's car, Clark Kent, disguised in a prison guard's uniform, is ushered into the warden's office at the city jail. This way. Thank you. Yes? What can I do for you? My name is Edwards, Warden. I was sent down from the state prison to escort that transfer, Benson. What? Oh, yes, sir. He's scheduled to leave at nine. Who sent you down? Why, uh, the head guard, uh, Mr. McGuire. Well, you can go back, Edwards, and tell your head guard to check next time before sending a man 50 miles on a wild goose chase. Wild goose chase? Isn't Benson being transferred? Sure, sure he's being transferred, but he left at 8 o'clock, almost 40 minutes ago. But he was supposed to leave at 9. I know, but the DA's office called and switched it to 8. Sorry you had to make the trip for nothing. Oh, that's that's all right. Uh, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, if he left 40 minutes ago, I'm too late. Someone crossed me up. Someone in the district attorney's office. Yeah, this must be the door to the street. Yeah. Now, if I can find an alley to get rid of this uniform. Ah, here's one. It's dark enough. There, does it? Now, off with Kent's clothes. I'll have to move fast to make it in time. Even a Superman. Now, up, up, and away! Red cloak streaming in the wind, the man of steel streaks into the darkness with the speed of light, battling against time in the black shadow of impending death. Following the Conway Turnpike, his sharp eyes scan the white ribbon of road, searching for the telltale red light that marks the sheriff's car. Suddenly, he spots it far ahead, swoops down in a breathtaking dive. That's the car, right below me. I don't know how I made it, but I did. No time to stop them now. The bridge must be up ahead a mile or so. I just drop down gently on the top of the car and ride along with them. It's dark enough so I won't be seen. Down! Down! There. 
I don't think they heard that. Not with the motor racing the way it is. This isn't too bad after all. Now let's see how far Renard and his gunman will get. Meanwhile, back at the bridge house, Duke Renard stands at the bank of levers controlling the draw while Curly peers out the window. Well, what's doing? I don't know yet. I've seen some headlights. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, there's a car coming. Sheriff's car? I can't tell yet. It's about a mile up the road, but coming fast. Look for the red light sticking up out of the top, above the windshield. I don't see no red light. Yeah, I see it now. That's the sheriff's buggy. Okay, we'll open the bridge. She's open swell, Duke. Okay, keep your eye on it. Where's the car? About half a mile away. Sure, it's got a red light. Yeah, you can't miss it now. How's the bridge? I think it's open far enough. Yeah, plenty. Shut it off. Come on over and watch. This is going to be something. See the car coming? Yeah, I see it. <laughs> Ain't they going to be surprised and they don't find nothing but air under them? I only see one car. No cops following them. Well, that makes it easier. Here she comes. Wait till you hear them brakes squeal at the last second when it's too late. Yeah, that'll be something. It won't be long now. He's traveling fast. Another couple of seconds. You can't tell the draw's open. This is it. He's falling. Right into the drink. Hey, Duke, look. He ain't falling no more. The car's flying across the other side. You're crazy. No, he ain't. Look. What? Hey, we're seeing things. Hey, there's a car on the road again. Heading for the state prison. Something's wrong. The bridge didn't open. We gotta follow him. Come on. The bridge open, gentlemen. Huh? And you're not following anyone. Who are you? I watch over drawbridges that rats like you open. Give it to him, Curly. Now, you bet I will. I'll take that gun. No. Hey, you're breaking my arm. Drop the gun. No. Yeah, that's it. Keep away from that gun, Renard. I said keep away from it. All right, maybe you'll obey this order. <laughs> now, you're next, Curly. Oh, I ain't done nothing. Honest, I ain't. It was him figured this out. Who's behind all this, Curly? Who's the big guy? I don't know. I swear I don't. He never told us. You're lying. Uh, ask Duke. Go ahead. Ask him. He's coming, too. Uh, all right. Get up on your feet, Renard. Up. Uh, boy, hit me. I did. It was only a sample. Now, who's your boss, Renard? Who's the big guy? You'll never get me to talk. Never. That's what you think. Close the drawbridge, Curly. Okay. Where's the gatekeeper? I don't know. Where is he, Curly? Talk fast. It's tied up the car on the other side of the bridge. All right. Turn that motor off. We'll get the keeper after we take you two specimens up for a little ride. I think that may loosen your tongues. I ain't done nothing. Come on, we'll find out what you've done. Here we go. Uh, Hello? Yes, this is the district attorney's office. Who? Oh, just a minute. Probably Mr. White. Yes, he wants to know what about the story. Oh, tell him I'll be in within the hour. Mm -hmm. He'll be at the planet office within the hour, Mr. White. <laughs> okay. He says if you're not, you're fired. <laughs> For the 50th time. Can't I still can't believe you've solved this thing. You know, it doesn't make sense. Why should the... Oh, hello, Miss Carroll. Good evening, Mr. Warren. I'm sorry I had to drag you down at this hour of the night, but... As I told you over the phone, we had some trouble on that Benson transfer, and I, uh, I need some records. It's quite all right, Mr. Warren. You know Mr. Kent. Of course. Good evening. Oh, good evening. What records do you wish, Mr. Warren? Well, we'd like to know what you're getting for fish today, Miss <gasps> Carol. Ah, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Oh, no, I mean, I mean, no, I don't understand. I... There's no um... use lying, Miss Carol. Duke Renard confessed. Oh. We know the whole story. All right. And you know it. There's just one thing we don't know. Why did you influence Henry Benson to steal public money? Because I wanted nice things. Because I wanted to live like a decent human being. And you needed almost a million dollars to do that. What happened to that money? I don't know. Renard got most of it. The rest we spent. I have some bonds, some cash... Oh, what's the difference? <laughs> and so, once again, Clark Kent in the role of Superman solves another mystery and brings the enemies of truth and justice to the punishment they so richly deserve. But even as he returns to the Daily Planet office to write the story of the Benson case, another adventure is brewing. So don't forget to tune in the next episode and begin another exciting adventure with Superman. Don't forget... Tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman.
Superman is a cop.